Good afternoon and uh, hello from uh, Thessaloniki. Uh, it's a real pleasure for, for uh, Aristotle University that uh, is organizing uh, this uh, uh, phenomenal uh, forum, which we name it Aristotle Medical Forum, after the Hellenic Diaspora Medical Forum that we have formed uh, one and a half years ago, uh, trying to merge uh, the academic medical forces around the world uh, with uh, the umbrella of uh, the School of Medicine, Aristotle University. So as uh, we promote uh, all academic activities, including mobility, as well as research, education, but uh, also going to strategy. And uh, that's why you are trying to bring forward to everyone uh, social uh, issues that uh, uh, are really very demanding. So for this uh, AEMF, uh, the fledgling uh, AEMF, we have picked up two major, uh, let's say, issues that contemporary uh, are really uh, very, very hot. One is uh, innovation, biomedical innovation and research, which will be uh, tomorrow's topic. And uh, what is today? the biggest issue and uh, what uh, really uh, is uh, to everyone's uh, tongue uh, is pandemia. So this pandemic, uh, which uh, all of a sudden uh, came up, which is the COVID-19 pandemic, and uh, uh, whatever uh, follows it uh, really burden what we call well-being. For this, we have uh, a, a huge panel, a very big panel of uh, uh, world-leading experts that will discuss uh, several topics about well-being, about pandemic, physical, mental, uh, vaccination, as well as uh, any peripherals that are going with this, uh, 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 with this situation. I have the honor and the pleasure to have as a, a moderator Professor Elias Mosialos from uh, London School of Economics, to whom I will hand over, so as uh, he will coordinate uh, the uh, eminent uh, discussions and uh, uh, all the lecturers uh, that hopefully will clear up the topic that I have uh, just introduced. So, Professor Mosialos, I'm giving you the speech. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Anastasiadis, for this very kind introduction. Uh, I would like to thank everyone for joining our session today on well-being. Welcome to all of you in the room and also joining us online. Uh, dear panelists, thank you again for your willingness to participate and your flexibility with the time. So the first part of the session will involve presentations by panelists and the second part brief interventions by several leading experts, politicians and academics. After that, Professors Anastasiadis and I would like to give the audience a chance to ask questions. So welcome again to all of you. This panel is focused on well-being. To build a post-pandemic future in which everyone's health is protected and promoted, what can we learn from the events of COVID-19 pandemic and previous crises? Contagion characterized crises such as the 9-11 attacks in 2001, with the aftermaths of conflict and migration, large-scale migration, the 2007 financial crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic. An event in one country spread rapidly to other countries, yet not all countries were affected to the same extent. What mattered to more desirable outcomes was leadership, policies based on available evidence rather than ideology and beliefs and preparedness. We see this clearly in the COVID-19 pandemic. Did those in charge respond rapidly and decisively? Did they follow the science? Had they invested in the modern public health systems that past outbreaks of SARS, Ebola virus disease and Zika virus disease had shown, were so important? Like most emerging infectious diseases, including the continuing challenge of antimicrobial resistance, the new virus emerged at the interface between humans, animals, and the natural environment. 
the philosophy and approach of One Health, which sits at the, this interface, must become the focus of our healthcare systems, our health and social care policies, and overall government policies. The pandemic has also revealed new determinants of health, such as digital exclusion, and it highlighted the value of the many essential workers and healthcare workers who contribute so much to managing and addressing the challenges of the pandemic. However, the pandemic also reinforced existing, existing extensive inequalities and brought forth new ones between the elderly who could not go outside and the young who were kept inside by government decisions, between professionals who could work from home and factory workers who could not, between protected workers and the self-employed who lost significant parts of their income or all income, between citizens in rich countries whose governments could borrow their way out of the country out of the crisis and those in poor countries which did not have the resources to fight the pandemic. Furthermore, strategies to manage public health risks themselves posed new risks to those whose healthcare needs could not be met due to the diversion of resources to managing the pandemic, to the economy, to the potential victims of the domestic violence, to the education and welfare of children, to name only a few. These impacts are unequally distributed ac across countries and across different socioeconomic groups within societies. And there is, of course, a significant gender dimension in terms of the burden of managing uh, uh, the pandemic. The crisis has revealed how inadequate some healthcare systems are, even in Europe, even within the European Union. Therefore, how should health and social care system change as a result of this pandemic? And how can health and social care systems help us improve the well-being of our people and the well-being of our societies? Too often politicians and experts have said never again. This will never happen again. But memories fade. This time, we must learn the lessons of history. We should not fail again. Without further ado, I would like to invite my very good friend, Dr. Hans Kluge, from uh, the regional office of the World Health Organization. Uh, Hans is a very experienced policymaker, uh, and he has changed the direction of, to, of the office over the past few months to the better, I would say. This is widely acknowledged by the academic community, but also by the policymaking community. Hans, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Professor Mosiaos and Professor Anastasiadis, Excellencies, Deputy Minister Ms. Rapti, Rector of the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, Dr. Papino, professors from the Greek diaspora all around the world, colleagues and friends, Kalispera Sas. Few places are better suited really than Greece when talking about well-being. The concept had such a strong ties to Greece. Since the times of Hippocrates, 2,500 years ago, to keys and colleagues describing the Greek way of life and the Mediterranean diet, illustrated in Crete and Corfu studies in the 70s of the 20th century. It is really my genuine honor to address you on this day dedicated to highlighting innovative achievements of health and medicine and support the future of public health at the famous Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. What you are part of is a global scientific forum, including top researchers and academics from all over the world, Nobel Prize committee members, policymakers and leaders alike. A truly multi-stakeholder space for reflection as we move forward building the public health of the future, as Professor Elias Mosialos was telling. First of all, let me sincerely congratulate Greece for its achievement in the field of health and well-being. Recent progress in the field of tobacco control is one example, but a very important example. Greece is also supporting other member states in the European region through the new WHO Center of Excellence the Athens Quality of Care Center, launched in collaboration with the Greek government in April, for which I'm very grateful. 
Thanks to Greece, finally, this office is putting quality of care, patient safety on the European agenda again. Nearly two years into an unprecedented pandemic, let me paint a picture for you. Three out of every four member states in our region report significant disruption of vital health services, ranging from prevention to rehabilitation. Such disruptions contribute to an increase in morbidity, disability and mortality, while patients living with chronic diseases also have a high risk of poor outcomes. Despite good progress, the European region still has the highest levels of tobacco use and the highest per capita consumption of alcohol. Around one third of adults are physically inactive and we have some of the highest level of hypertension and salt consumption in the world. 60% of adults are overweight, 20% are obese, and diabetes is on the rise. Crises and shocks trigger change, and COVID-19 is no exception. It provides an opportunity to rethink services, fix fractures, and close gaps that have been magnified. Helping us to do so is the roadmap of the Pan-European Commission on Health and Sustainable Development, whose findings will be made public tomorrow by its chair, Professor Mario Monti. And I'm very proud, very appreciative to Professor Elias Mosialov, who in fact was the professor who drew my attention on the necessity of such a Pan-European Commission on Health and Sustainable Development. And thank you, dear Elias, for being the scientific coordinator of this commission, which concluded its work today. There are actionable recommendations of this commission for governments and decision makers. Recommendations that save lives and livelihoods, empower people and protect the planet. A groundbreaking declaration adopted at the Athens Mental Health Summit recently, hosted by Greece and jointly co-organized by WHO Europe, recognizes the mental health impact of COVID-19. It calls for placing mental health at the heart of the recovery. And that is why I'm delighted to announce that negotiations with Professors Fontolakis and Khordakis under the leadership of President Anastasiadis are well underway for the establishment of a new WHO Collecting Center at the Aristotle University focusing on well-being and covering areas from nutrition to mental health in line with WHO's European program of work. Moving health systems forward must become adaptive, responsive and people-centered. Building stronger links between primary care, public health services and hospital care settings, focusing on community-level monitoring and evaluating population needs is vital. Improving and streamlining the care continuum is one of the best investments we can make. Accelerated progress is possible if we have the courage to apply the many lessons learned. Health is one of the most innovative sectors in society, ranging from digital health services to promoting a culture of healthy living using all the potential of behavioral change interventions. And let me list three ways of building back better. First, we need to up our investments in health systems. Although much of our attention has been focused on the pandemic, we cannot forget the general commitment to promote health and well-being for all. To a large extent, that depends on the performance and excellence of our health systems anchored in a strong primary health care to move towards universal health coverage. Second, we need high quality and timely data to take stock and inform decisions, measure inequalities between and within countries, have appropriate levels of desegregation for different variables including gender and take decisive action. We need to increase the trust in science. And finally, third, the European Program of Work provides a crucial opportunity for all member states
to listen to the needs of almost 1 million people across the region, calling for partnerships across all sectors in society. The fight to promote health extends beyond the health sector. The distinct WHO and United Nations declarations highlight the importance of adopting a multi-sectoral approach in which sectors such as agriculture, trade, education and media play key roles in helping us to achieve our common goals. Inspired by a sense of urgency and the pressure to innovate, I remain confident we can and will achieve lasting progress based on the ingenuity of the region. But we need to act now. We must redouble our efforts to fight preventable diseases through innovation and accelerate digital transformation. Let's act together in partnership and solidarity for health and well-being. Health and well-being. Efkaristopoli. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hans. Efkaristoume Poli from Greece uh, for framing the discussion from a WHO perspective and also for the announcement on the uh, WHO Collaborating Center to be based at the Aristotle University in Thessaloniki. Uh, we very much appreciate this uh, and we're looking forward to further collaboration between the World Health Organization, the Regional Office for Europe and Greece. Uh, I think we have uh, a few minutes now for questions and answers. Uh, because Dr. Kluge will have to join another meeting and he cannot stay until the end of this event. So if there is no question, I think uh, Professor Moschalos has a couple of questions from what I'm aware of to RD. <laughs> Uh, I could uh, I could t uh, exercise the privilege of chairing uh, chairing this particular discussion just to ask Hans what uh, are your plans uh, in terms of uh, changing governance structures within international organisations in order to get better prepared to address the next crisis. Thank you, thank you, dear uh, Elias. It's a question which keeps us busy day and night. I think the worst thing that WHO can do now is defensive. And all of us have to be very open-minded to think towards the future and acknowledge that all of us could have been done better. So on a pan-European level, I would say a number of things. There is a need in our view, which was supported, as you know, dear Elias, by the Monti Commission, to have a kind of a forum, a pan-European council at heads of state to foresight health threats because still, I give one example. The COVID-19 certificate is a huge issue. There are people, for example, from San Marino. I was talking to the Minister of Health and Solidarity, my good friend, Mr. Roberto Chavata. They have a challenge because they were vaccinating the people with vaccines not approved by EMA. And students have challenge now to enter, for example, Italian universities. So we don't have a pan-European forum at the government level to really boost, to boost policy coherence. Then the next one is the same at the technical level of a European, pan-European network on center of disease control and prevention. Because no one is safe until everyone is safe. We are one pan-European region. And of course, there are many ideas floating now on the global level, but I will not come to those ones. Maybe a last one, because reflecting a lot on myself as the region director in the region here. I strongly believe for the future of WHO reform that we need much more inter-regional collaboration because the constitutional comparative advantage of WHO is that we are federated in six interlinked regions with a political proximity to the countries. If a country is in trouble, before they go to Geneva, they will come to the regional office based on the trust. So these are some of uh, the thoughts, dear Elias. Thank you very much, Hans. In my brief intervention, uh, I refer to the well-being of children. Uh, and schools are about to open over the next few weeks in most European countries. So what is your advice to European governments about reopening schools? This is a very timely question, uh, 
their areas. In fact, a week ago, I gave a press briefing with the region director of UNICEF exactly on this topic. And our principle remains unchanged. The schools should be the last ones to close and the first ones to open and to put in place basic public health measures. It can go obviously from physical distancing, from a certain age, masks if children can tolerate it, smaller sizes of the classes, but not forgetting that the school is not an isolated biotope, right? If we look at schools, we always have to look at the dynamics in the larger community because a lot of the infection doesn't happen in the school, but at the school gates, in the buses, if they're overcrowded, going to the schools. And of course, to have a special vaccination strategy with a priority to give vaccines to the teachers and to the parents. And ultimately, what we discussed, dear Elias, in, in, uh, in Greece, and again, I have to come back to this, to comment your country, the only country I know of which has a deputy minister for mental health, thanks to the commitment of your Prime Minister Mitsotakis, who was present himself together with the Vice President of the European Commission, Mr. My good friend also, Mr. Margrethe Sh uh, Shinas, to put mental health in the center of the recovery, particularly of children, because many children, including, right, we all know if we have children myself, like I have two teenage daughters, that was a year of frozen development because a school is a place also of social and cognitive development. Thank you very much, Hans, and thank you for joining us uh, and uh, offering your very useful insights and your wisdom to, uh, to our forum. Thank you. Professor thank you. Before he goes, may I exercise my Absolutely. privilege also as a, a moderator to ask a, a common question that uh, uh, people are asking, not scientifically, but uh, from social point of view. Uh, it's a dual question. First is... Uh, uh, from uh, from your WHO, uh, let's say, estimation, when do you think this uh, pandemic will uh, go off? I mean, when will, uh, do you estimate from calendar, calendar point of view it will uh, overcome uh, all these uh, uh, pandemic uh, issues? And the second is, uh, what do you think is the new normal? I mean, from a lifestyle point of view, since uh, you said a lot of, about well-being and uh, 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 let's say not just physical, but uh, mental point of view, what will be our new normal? Uh, are we going back to our lives or uh, is it something uh, uh, adjustable that we will have uh, in, in, in the next? Thank you. Thank you, Professor. You're asking me all, all the very uh, tough and challenging uh, questions, but that's why I expect I respect so much the uh, uh, the Greek uh, academicians, and you're right. So, number of points here, pro dear professor and my dear friends. I cannot tell when, but I can tell how. I see five impediments to anticipate the end. One, too few people are ready to embrace vaccination and public health measures. In 23 countries, there is a plateauing of the vaccination. Second impediment. Too many countries still have trouble with basic access to vaccines. In the high income countries in our region, 58% got full dose. If I look at the low and lower income countries, only 9%. The third impediment is that too many countries think too fast that the pandemic is finished while in fact it's only another wave which is just passing. Fourth impediment, too fragmented is our knowledge on the pattern of transmission and immunity protection linked to vaccine uptake. And finally, something that I discussed at large during my first formal mission to the United States to the White House in August with the chief medical advisor to the United States President Dr. Anthony Fauci, we both believe that far too few attention to the development of therapeutics. So these are the impediments. But as Professor Elias knows, I'm an optimist from nature. So I believe we can overcome all five of them with three strategic directions. One, to equally roll out the vaccines. You know, I'm, uh, I'm not convinced that the moratorium 
is helpful. We need to have a comprehensive strategy to increase uptake, production, sharing. And we need to do it with the private sector. This is new for WHO. I mean, we have to have a realistic, goal-oriented strategy with the, uh, the private sector. Number two, we need to implement what I call a nuanced approach in the pan-European region. Like, for example, expand the vaccination to children and additional doses, additional jabs. We should not look at the third dose as something that we are taking away from someone who didn't get a first dose. It's a way to protect our vulnerable people. But at the same time, we should absolutely make sure that there are vaccines for doctors and nurses in Africa, in India, in Thailand. So do it all. We will do it all. Even we calculated. I had the Director General Monday here in my office next to me of the International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Associations. Professor Elias is part of the Oslo Medicines Initiative. Even if there will be so-called boosters, still there will be 1.2 billion doses extra this year. But we need political leadership. Countries are sitting too long on their vaccines, hoping to resell them, and then giving them to countries when the expiry date is too short. I mean, many low-income countries, they just cannot accept huge donations at the last moment. And third strategy, even and especially in periods of tranquility, we should keep proportionate pressure on the virus. We should not surrender on masks. I always, even in Denmark, no masks. I always have my mask with me on indoor ventilation, cross-border mobility control, and intensified policy, uh, testing policies, including genomic sequencing. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kluge. I think it was very informative, and uh, I believe that uh, we might be able to overcome all this with uh, what you have already mentioned. I mean, vaccination, uh, compliance, and uh, hopefully follow the science. This is the secret, I believe. Thank you. Thank you, Hans. Are there any additional questions? If not, thank you very much again, Hans, and looking forward to having you again in our future events. Thank you. Anytime, anytime for my Greek friends. Thank you so much. Stay healthy. Thank you. So our, our next speaker is Professor Marion Kupmans, who is a distinguished professor of virology and public health and head of the Erasmus Medical Center Department of Viroscience. Professor Kupmans, uh, it's a great honor to have you here with us today. Thank you very much. Um, yes, thank you very much for having me. And it's a, it's a very interesting and, of course, very important topic um, that uh, you are addressing here. And I fully uh, uh, endorse the importance of it. So I was asked to give my perspective on, on COVID in relation to uh, well-being. And I will do that just from my virology perspective and I've been involved in many advisory roles around the pandemic and pandemic control. So what do I see as key uh, issues that um, that have uh, emerged during the pandemic um, in relation to well-being? First of all, of course, there is the direct health impacts um, on people that had COVID um, particularly also uh, the longer term uh, consequences of uh, an infection, even mild infection in the condition that is uh, now has, we've come to know as uh, long COVID, which is still fairly poorly defined and creates a lot of uncertainty for people that experience it um, because there's no real um, uh, stakeholder or placeholder for this type of condition. I think that's an important topic and it has also been recognized in WHO um, meetings to set the agenda for the future. Um, the second element is a bit related to this is that there are certain longer term aspects uh, that keep coming up but for which it's not clear if there's a relationship. There's two categories. One is a relation with um, clotting type disorders, 
post COVID. And the second is a potential relationship with neurological type uh, disorders. Uh, there's some pieces, bits and pieces of information there. Uh, not clear if it's real, but it is creating uncertainty in people that have had uh, COVID. <clears throat> then, of course, there's the clear health impacts of delayed diagnosis, the impact that COVID, that the pandemic has had on the entire uh, care sector and access to care uh, because of uh, overburdening of the, the health system, um, which uh, has um, a, an after effect in delayed, for instance, cancer diagnosis and delayed treatments for otherwise treatable conditions. Uh, and I think that's an important element. Then, uh, very importantly, uh, as just mentioned, the mental health impact. And what we're seeing, uh, I would like to designate several categories. First, the healthcare workers that have been at the front, li front line, um, really struggling through uh, taking care of critically ill patients under constant pressure initially with applause but later during the pandemic also at the receiving end of criticism and 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 aggression uh i think they do deserve a special place to all um, and it's important to also avoid uh, that we lose many healthcare workers that are uh, tired of of this whole business second category is uh children and young adults who have been uh, disproportionately affected. On the one hand, the disease impact for them is not that, that big, but the need to close schools, close higher education, stop uh, you know, uh, uh, real life training, uh, uh, stop uh, social life really has, it has a major impact on that group. Third is the uncertainty for many business owners, um, uh, and, and workers that have been impacted economically, I think for the region, tourism industry is also quite important uh, as, a, as a very Im important point. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so, so those are the ones. Then long-term impacts on, on more maybe like a societal level, societal health. Uh, I think it's the um the something that i'm looking at with some concern is the polarization that we're seeing so we're seeing uh, regions in the world where uh, anti uh, science movements really have become very strong where there's movements that deny the existence or the seriousness of the pandemic there's the anti vaccine movement and that uh, and there's a lot of people that are caught in between because they hear all of this, they do not know who to believe anymore, and there's a sort of a global erosion of trust, which I think I, I think we should label also as part of uh, well-being. And then finally, the uh, global inequality, for instance, in access to care and access to vaccines, which um, I'm pretty sure... Uh, will come to haunt us and, and uh, if we don't really figure out a way of how to uh, deal with that. So that for me are, uh, are uh, when I look at it, really important points of impact of, of the pandemic on uh, well-being. I do want to end with a few um, more positive notes because I do think these are all extremely important and we need to take them in in our uh, looking uh, forward um, is that of course we also have seen just the sheer power of science on the other hand the, the incredible uh, development of vaccines uh, that who would have thought that by the end of uh, 2020 would, we would have a range of vaccines to choose from even um, that all have quite a uh, good performance that's i think a, a success for science and investing in science and we should put our brains to work to see on how we can also address that to the, the well-being questions that are coming up and i think the pandemic had also brought home the the how important it is to keep um 
and to build how precious our care system and public health system are, how underfunded they have been, uh, and that I think there's now a broad agreement that that needs to change as well. So that to me, those to me are, you know, some positive uh, consequences of this pandemic. So um, with that, I think that would be my opening statement. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this uh, very useful uh, uh, insights. Uh, and I'm sure you will be prepared to take a few questions later on. Uh, thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Albert Burla, the CEO of Pfizer. Uh, we will have a pre-recorded presentation by Dr. Burla, who is also a graduate from Aristotle University in Thessaloniki. Καλημέρα σας. Θα ήθελα να ευχαριστήσω τους διοργανωτές, τον καθηγητή Κυριάκο Αναστασιάδη, το Τμήμα Ιατρικής και το Αριστοτέλειο Πανεπιστήμιο Θεσσαλονίκης για την πρόσκληση να συμμετέχω σε αυτό το πρώτο Aristotle Medical Forum. Μακάρι να μπορούσα να είμαι κοντά σας σε αυτή την άκρος ενδιαφέρουσα και μοναδική επιστημονική εκδήλωση. Στόχος αυτής της πρωτοβουλίας είναι η ανάδειξη της επιστήμης, της καινοτομία και των στρατηγικών στον χώρο της υγειονομικής περίθαλψης, καθώς και η ανάπτυξη συνεργασιών και ενός δυναμικού δικτύου επιφανών επιστημόνων και άλλων σημαντικών εταίρων εντός και εκτός Ελλάδα. Δεν μπορώ να σκεφτώ πιο σημαντικό στόχο τη στιγμή που εργαζόμαστε για να δώσουμε τέλος στην παρούσα πανδημία, αλλά και να, για να είμαστε καλύτερα προετοιμασμένοι για την επόμενη. Η νόσος COVID-19 είναι μια απειλή για την παγκόσμια υγεία που συμβαίνει μία φορά στα 100 χρόνια και επέφερε τεράστια επιβάρυνση στα υγειονομικά συστήματα και τις ζωές των ανθρώπων. Όμως, στην πορεία μας ως εδώ, καταφέραμε απίστευτες επιστημονικές ανακαλύψεις. Δημιουργήσαμε πρωτόγνωρη παγκόσμια συνεργασία και επιλύσαμε φαινομενικά ανυπέρβλητα προβλήματα στην παραγωγή και την εφοδιαστική αλυσίδα. Το αποτέλεσμα? Δισεκατομμύρια δόσεις σωτήριων εμβολίων έναντι της νόσου COVID-19 να έχουν διανεμηθεί σε όλον τον κόσμο πριν το τέλος του έτους. Πρόκειται για ένα σπουδαίο επίτευγμα που γεννά την ίδια στιγμή ένα σημαντικό ερώτημα. Αν μπορούμε να κάνουμε κάτι τέτοιο για την νόσο COVID-19, γιατί να μην μπορούμε να το κάνουμε και για τα εκατομμύρια των ανθρώπων που πάσχουν από άλλες σοβαρές ασθένειες, για ανθρώπους με εξίσου επίγουσες ανάγκες. Γι' αυτό λοιπόν σχεδιάζουμε να αξιοποιήσουμε τα διδάγματα που αποκομίσαμε από την αντιμετώπιση της COVID-19 προς όφελος όλων των ασθενών. Η ταχύτητα με την οποία αλληλεπιδρούμε με τις ρυθμιστικές αρχές, καθώς και η συνεχής επιτάκηση των ψηφιακών λύσεων, είναι μόνο μερικά από όσα σχεδιάζουμε να εφαρμόσουμε μελλοντικά στις κλινικές μελέτες μας, προκειμένου να συνεχίσουμε να κινούμαστε με την ταχύτητα της επιστήμης. Ωστόσο, η παγκόσμια επιστημονική κοινότητα βρίσκεται επίσης αντιμέτωπη με ορισμένες προκλήσεις. Ένα τέτοιο παράδειγμα είναι η ενεξελίξη συζήτηση σχετικά με την πνευματική ιδιοκτησία και την προστασία των πατεντών και το κατά πόσον αυτή λειτουργεί ως εμπόδιο ή ως καταλήτης για αυξημένη πρόσβαση στα εμβόλια έναντι του COVID-19. Ως επιστήμενες γνωρίζετε ότι ο σεβασμός στην πνευματική ιδιοκτησία έχει τροφοδοτήσει η πρωτοποριακή έρευνα και έχει δώσει τη δυνατότητα για ευρεία συνεργασία μεταξύ πανεπιστημίων, κυβερνήσεων, ερευνητικών ινστιτούτων και φαρμακευτικών εταιριών. Και χρειαζόμαστε την βοήθειά σας για να συνεχίσουμε να διαδίδουμε αυτό το μήνυμα. Με ιδιαίτερη χαρά πληροφορούμε ότι η ελληνική πολιτεία συνεργάζεται με την ακαδημαϊκή κοινότητα για την δημιουργία ενός σταθερού πλαισίου που θα διέπει την σύσταση τεχνοβλαστών από πανεπιστήμια και ερευνητικά κέντρα και θα περιλαμβάνει την παροχή προστασίας για την πνευματική ιδιοκτησία. Εδώ στη Θεσσαλονίκη είμαι επίσης πολύ ευτυχής για το εξαιρετικό επίπεδο συνεργασίας που διέπει ολόκληρο το οικοσύστημα καινοτομία της πόλης και εμείς δεσμευόμαστε ότι από πλευράς μας θα συνεχίσουμε να συνεισφέρουμε. 
Στι παγκόσμιε δομέ τη Pfizer στη Θεσσαλονίκη εργάζονται ήδη πάνω από 350 άρτια κατηρτισμένοι επιστήμονε, μεταξύ των οποίων και απόδημοι Έλληνε. Και οι επενδύσει που πραγματοποιούμε στι εγκαταστάσει μα θα ενισχύσουν περαιτέρω το προφίλ καινοτομία τη χώρα μα. Δεν έπαψα ποτέ να πιστεύω ακράδοντα ότι η Ελλάδα έχει τη δυναμική να ευημερήσει αξιοποιώντας το ταλέντο και το πάθος των ανθρώπων της. Προκειμένου να κάνουμε πραγματικότητα αυτή τη δυναμική, πρέπει να συνεχίσουμε να εμπνέουμε και να στηρίζουμε τους νέους επιστήμονες της Ελλάδας μέσα από πρωτοβουλίες όπως το Aristotle Medical Forum. Σας εκφράζω τα συγχαρητήριά μου που δώσατε σάρκα και οστά σε μια επιστημονική εκδήλωση τόσο υψηλού επίπεδου. Εύχομαι το συνέδριο αυτό να είναι παραγωγικό, διαφωτιστικό και ευχάριστο για όλους σας. Μείνετε ασφαλείς, να είστε καλά και μην ξεχνάτε ότι στο τέλος η επιστήμη θα νικήσει. Our compatriot, the CEO of Pfizer, who also raised a number of uh, uh, important points, including how we can address unmet therapeutic needs. There are two different types of unmet need, unmet therapeutic need and unmet medical need, unmet access to uh, essential and important medical and healthcare services. And if we manage to um, produce such a significant number of vaccines in less than a year, Uh, through significant investments of the public sector, not only the private sector, because in this particular case, the public sector bore most of the risk, uh, particularly in Europe, with significant investments from the European Union and a number of European governments, including Britain and Germany. Can we use similar paradigms in terms of the scientific discoveries in the future to address unmet therapeutic needs, not only in the area of infectious diseases, where there are significant needs in the area of antibiotics, but also in diseases of the neurodegenerative system. Uh, in kidney disease, where there are no therapeutic options, uh, uh, people have to get dialysis or a transplantation if they are lucky. Otherwise, there are no therapeutic means of stopping the evolution of the kidney disease from stage one to uh, stage five. Uh, without further ado, I would like to invite our next speaker, Christos Kiratsus, who is the Vice President of Regeneron Pharmaceuticals. They have invested heavily in monoclonal antibodies for the treatment of COVID-19. It is a pioneering company in the area of therapeutics, and we're looking forward to your presentation, Christos. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for the, <clears throat> very much for the invitation. Good morning from New York. Good afternoon in Greece. Um, and uh, the Vice President of Reese is here at Regeneron Pharmaceuticals, and we are a company that is focusing on development of monoclonal antibodies. And I was asked to, to talk about our effort to develop, um, to, to discover and develop monoclonal antibodies for COVID-19. So give me one second to, um, please let me know if you can see my slides. Not yet, yes, but now, yes, we can see them now. Okay, perfect. So continuing a little bit on the theme that you, Dr. Mosiello, started, and I think, I think some of the, uh, the previous speakers also talked about, that we need this continuous investment in both um, research and also technology development in order to be able to respond to this health crisis, including this pandemic of COVID-19. And as a company, Regeneron has spent most of the, th the last three decades a significant amount of investment in development of proprietary technologies for drug discovery, drug development, manufacturing, and all these technologies side by side can be leveraged in order to rapidly respond to emerging threats. We have built these end-to-end -end capabilities that we call Velocity Suite technologies, and we now have eight FDA-approved medicine, and this is the exact same technologies that we are applying to infectious diseases, and also during outbreak settings, including during MERS, Ebola virus, and now with SARS-CoV-2, in order to develop our uh, antibodies. And what these technologies allow us is to basically try and discover, manufacture, and develop these antibodies <clears throat> in timelines that are significantly faster than the timelines, the development timelines that we are used to in the past. So we can go from initiation of an outbreak uh, and publication of a sequence of a pathogen, all the way into having material that is ready for clinical trials, for clinical testing, in as little as three to six months. We've done it before for Ebola. 
we used, we selected a triple antibody cocktail that we call Regeneron EB3, and it was shown in a WHO run clinical trial to dramatically, to be dramatically superior to preventing Ebola death um, against the control arm of the study. And this became the first FDA approved treatment for Ebola virus late last year. We use the same technologies for another coronavirus that luckily never became a pandemic and is called MERS coronavirus that is causing this endemic disease in Saudi Arabia and neighboring countries. We made an antibody cocktail and then we, uh, and we performed phase one clinical testing in collaboration with the NIH. And of course, now we are applying the same set of technologies against SARS-CoV-2 and I'm gonna you know, give you more details on that. But the question, of course, that we are very um, frequently asked is why are we using fully human monoclonal antibodies? And what is, you know, what are some of the differences between human monoclonal antibodies and vaccines? Since both are utilizing either isolation and uh, giving purified antibodies or development of antibodies um, uh, within the host of somebody that is being uh, vaccinated. And of course, both are complementary measures to get rid of certain threats, including these um, uh, 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 pandemics. So for monoclonal antibodies, they rarely have off-target toxicity. The immune system is selecting for antibodies to be extremely specific for their target. We can find antibodies with that kind of specificity, and that's exactly why their tox profile is usually predictable. Unlike vaccines, the antibodies can provide immediate protection. Of course, the general population needs to be vaccinated, and that's exactly how you get protection. But somebody who is exposed to the virus or is at a very high risk um, uh, to be exposed to the virus and doesn't have time to develop an immune response or cannot develop an immune response because they are immune compromised, a, a monoclonal antibodies that can provide the immediate protection that they need. It's fairly straightforward to identify multiple antibodies that bind to diverse epitopes on the pathogen. And oops, sorry about that. And um, I'm going to tell you why this is important. And of course, using all these new technologies, you can do all these antibody development and manufacturing very, very quickly. So specifically for uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2, what we were able to do is go from publication of the sequence, which as you very well know, uh, uh, happened on January 13th of last year. We started immunizing mice and getting antibody B cells from convalescent humans to selecting the best antibodies from this mix to create manufacturing ready cell lines to scale them up, make the, ma make the material in bioreactors and put them in clinical trials in June only five months after initiation of the program. And it took us another few months to get clinical data, and I'm gonna go through some of the clinical data, to get FDA emergency use authorization, starting with non-hospitalized patients and later extending to other, to other populations. But this is only, we are only able to do this because of the technologies that we developed over the years, several years before the pandemic, to both select, um, clone, and manufacture these antibodies. We are starting from either mice that are expressing human antibodies or from human donors that were infected and recovered from COVID-19. Um, using B cell selection technologies, we are finding the B cells that are expressing the specific antibodies. We are cloning the genes for the heavy and the light chain, and we are making cell lines that can produce these antibodies at very high levels. But of course, we want to know what kind of antibodies do we want to choose? What are the properties? What are the desired characteristics of these antibodies um, that we want to eventually put in clinical development. As you very well know, SARS-CoV-2 is, um, uh, is decorated with this protein called spike, depicted here in this purple color. And it's the interaction between spike and H2, the receptor of the virus, that is mediating entry of the virus into the human cells and eventual <clears throat> replication of the virus inside. What we are doing is we are selecting for antibodies that are binding to spike and are neutralizing this interaction between this protein and H2. And by doing that, they, um, uh, they block the virus from entering inside the cell. We want to combine non-overlapping epitopes, and I'm going to talk about that in a bit. We want to cover as many variants as possible. We don't want to generate escape. And of course, we want these antibodies to, um, uh, to work in vivo. Here you can see a panel of multiple different antibodies in this in vitro neutralization assays. Suffice to say that we are able to select a lot of different antibodies. These are all fully human antibodies that are at extremely low concentrations, very, very potently neutralizing the virus. They're blocking the ability of the virus to get inside cells and initiate this round of replications. From very early on in the program, 
we um, and others uh, realize that SARS-CoV-2 being a virus changes all the time. So eventually you're going to start getting a lot of variants in the field. So what we've been doing is we've been monitoring for um, the presence of these variants in the population. We are cloning every single variant that we can identify. And we want to make sure that the antibodies that we have selecting are retaining their neutralization potency um, against them. And here you can see you know, all the different variants on the spike protein. There are more than 140 variants now that we have assessed um, in different neutralization assays to maintain the potency of these antibodies as we are using them uh, in our clinical studies and, of course, are being used in the field now as, um, uh, as products. So using these um, criteria, we ended up selecting for two antibodies, uh, 10933 and 10987, that are binding to two different epitopes of the virus. And the rationale here is to avoid, one, drug resistance, so because the virus needs to change two different epitopes at the same time when you're putting pressure, and that's much more unlikely as we have published um, uh, when compared to a single antibody, but also to provide coverage against circulating variants. Similar rationale, it's less likely to find variants that have epitopes against, um, uh, mutated epitopes against both of these um, antibodies. And of course, this is very important now. We are living in the age of variants, of course. Starting in the fall of 2020, there, are, there were many reports about variants uh, that started uh, to rapidly take over the viral uh, population. We knew of the UK variant, the South Africa, the Brazil, and now all the way to Delta and Mu and so on and so forth. So we want to make sure that our antibodies, we are selecting for cocktails of antibodies that are binding to all of these things. We are selecting for antibodies that are binding to conserved sites they don't change very much as these variants are being selected uh, in order to retain the efficacy. And here you can see some examples that we published a few months ago. Um, the, this is the uh, neutralization efficacy of our individual monoclonal antibodies and our antibody cocktail against a lot of the predominant variants um, at the time. And you can see that even in cases where one of our antibodies, you can see here, loses a little bit of its efficacy against some of these variants, the other antibody is there so that the cocktail remains um, uh, efficacious. Of course, this is something that is very, very important. The FDA, CDC, and the European agencies are monitoring for this presence of the variants and the activity of therapeutics, including our antibodies and competitor antibodies against these variants. And you can see that these are the reports that are being published by the FDA and are showing exactly <clears throat> how the different variants are um, are affecting the potency of these antibodies. And these kind of tables are being used to make clinical decisions now for the use of the antibodies in the different states uh, here in the US as variants go up and down. And the European Union is thinking of um, applying similar criteria. Moving from all the preclinical studies to the clinical studies, what we wanted to do is we wanted to evaluate our antibody cocktail called Regeneron Cov throughout the spectrum of COVID-19 disease. So, and when I talk about the spectrum, I mean um, from in, for prophylaxis, administering the cocktail in people that have not been exposed or have just been exposed to people that are positive uh, for the virus. We are testing them in an ambulatory setting. These are people that have recently tested positive. They have uh, symptoms of the disease for uh, less than a week, usually fairly mild symptoms. We are giving them the antibodies and we are trying to prevent hospitalization and death using these antibodies. And also in a hospitalized setting, the people that have severe symptoms of the disease, in many cases they require uh, supplemental oxygen or they are admitted in the ICU. And what we are trying to find out is uh, if their disease uh, progresses. So I'm gonna show you key data from each one of these trials, starting from um, uh, the, uh, the post-exposure prophylaxis uh, trial. In this case, what we are doing is we are identifying households so people that live together, there's one index case in the household, somebody that is already uh, infected, and the rest of the people that live with them are unfortunately unvaccinated and therefore at the risk of getting um, uh, of presenting with symptoms of um, uh, COVID-19. And what we are trying to measure is if administration of the antibodies is going to prevent the incidence of symptomatic infection in these people that are at high risk of developing disease. And as you can see here, we are decreasing the incidence of um, uh, symptomatic disease by a little bit over, oops, sorry, 80% um, uh, percent compared to the placebo, indicating that unvaccinated individuals 
or people that have not responded to the vaccine and um, are administered these antibodies, we are preventing transmission of, um, um, of the virus to these people by PCR. That's additional data I'm not showing today. And also uh, the incidence of symptomatic disease. This is some data here in people in the ambulatory setting. These are people that have just tested positive, they have mild symptoms of the disease, and we are monitoring at the top for hospitalizations and all-cause mortality, all-cause death. And I can see there are two different doses in this trial and one point gram dose of the, um, uh, of the antibody cocktail on the left and a 2.4 gram dose on the right. And you can see that in both cases, we are reducing both hospitalizations and all-cause mortality in this population by about um, uh, uh, 70 to 80%. And so basically what that says is, and we have a lot of data suggesting, uh, clearly demonstrating that the administration of the cocktail reduces the viral load um, uh, fairly uh, much faster than in the placebo patients, especially the high-risk individuals that are slow to mount their immune response. And when you are administering antibodies, monoclonal antibodies in this population, then you prevent progression of the disease, you prevent hospitalizations, you prevent death. In addition, what you are seeing here at the bottom is you are requiring less time um, to resolve your symptoms. Um, and what you can see in the gray line, this is the probability of symptom resolution for the placebo group. And what you can see with the orange and the blue line, again, these are the two dose groups. Um, that have been administered the, uh, the antibody cocktail. And you can see after a few, dose, a, a few days that the, people, the treated people start resolving um, uh, their symptoms faster. Finally, we performed um, a, a, a large hospitalization study uh, in collaboration uh, with uh, the recovery network in, um, in, in, in the UK. As you are probably aware, the recovery network is a network that has run the largest uh, hospitalization studies for COVID-19. So we were very fortunate to partner with them to test for the activity of the antibodies there. And what they were able to observe is people that are presenting with COVID-19 at the hospital and they require hospitalization, you can divide them in two different groups, seropositives and seronegatives. In people that were able to mount their own immune response against the virus, and seronegatives are the people that have not been able to mount their own immune against the virus for whatever reason. And the, the split is about two thirds to one third. One third of the people are going to the hospital and they, they, they still don't have their own antibodies. And this is the group that is at higher risk of um, uh, dying from COVID-19. There is, a, as you can see, uh, just the placebo groups, the usual care, it's, it's not placebo, it's usual care, between zero positive and zero negatives, there is a three times higher chance of dying from COVID-19 uh, when you are zero negative. And when you are treating, when you are administering, exogenously administering antibodies uh, to the seropositive group, you don't really see a benefit because these people already have their own antibodies. However, when you are giving these antibodies to the seronegative group, you are able to reduce um, the um, uh, death by about um, 20%. So what we are showing with our clinical trial program is that the, the administration of these antibodies can provide benefit for the entire spectrum of the disease However, the earlier you're giving the antibodies, the more benefit uh, you see, especially for the, um, uh, for the high-risk individuals. And with that, I would like to thank you um, for, uh, for listening. And of course, happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Professor Mosielos, we can't hear you. You have to switch on. Yeah, thank you very much, Christos, for this excellent presentation. We'll have time later on to discuss some additional issues related to access, uh, cost, administration, uh, and also production possibilities uh, over the next few months. Uh, we're moving on now from monoclonal antibodies to global surgery. Surgery is seen as an expensive luxury in healthcare systems and is being neglected in global pandemic recovery plans. The Lancet Commission on Global Surgery identifies surgery as an essential component of universal health coverage. However, early access to surgeons remains poor. Postoperative morbidity remains high, particularly in the Global South, and system capacity has proven fragile to external shocks. These problems are magnified in the Global South, where access to resources in surgical services is very limited. 
to ensure that surgical services around the world uh, do not further reduce in both volume and quality, we do need a roadmap for the next decade on surgical education. And our next speaker, uh, Patricia Turner, and thank you very much for joining us today, it's a great honor, is the director of the Division of Member Services of the American College of Surgeons. The American College of Surgeons has been involved in many initiatives to train surgeons in the Global South, and we're looking forward to your insights today. Thank you so much uh, for that kind introduction and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I was asked to speak today on the topic of the role of the American College of Surgeons in global surgical education and some of the challenges and some of the opportunities. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers um, of the 2021 Aristotle Medical Forum for this kind invitation and for the opportunity to share the virtual podium with the extraordinary faculty um, of this session. I've thoroughly enjoyed uh, listening to the previous uh, speakers. Um, in particular, I would also like to recognize Dr. Solfas, um, who is the chair of the International Relations Committee and president of the Greek chapter of the American College of Surgeons. Dr. Konstantinidis, who is um, the governor for Greece uh, to the ACS Board of Governors, and Dr. Um, Gerosius and uh, Nikidias, who are um, directors of the ACS Accredited Education Institute at Athens University. So we are privileged to have these uh, warm relationships um, with our, our colleagues in Greece. By way of, of introduction and background, as we, as we look retrospectively, the onset um, of the COVID-19 pandemic and the public health response required um, that we try to minimize the catastrophic spread of the disease. And that was really a catalyst for immediate changes in the traditional approach um, to continuing professional education for surgeons and amplified the need for more inclusive learning structures that transcended the barriers such as geography um, and time constraints. Um, while learning uh, virtual management systems existed and were used by the American College of Surgeons before the pandemic, um, COVID-19 forced the wider adoption of virtual platforms for education and for consideration of how we approach surgeons at every career stage while maintaining the high standards for which the college is known. Um, and to your earlier point, um, we know that we have uh, individual surgeons that are in the United States, that are around the world, that are in high resource countries, as well as in low resource countries. And it is our duty um, to try to provide um, surgical education in all of those platforms. Um, the pandemic's onset was a teachable moment for any professional society and anyone involved in medical education. Um, so the American College of Surgeons offers more than 50 different types of programs related to surgical education, many of which were affected by the pandemic. And today I'll focus on the challenges and the opportunities to medical education um, that we learned through our annual, annual clinical Congress, which is a premier um, surgical scientific uh, meeting um, for all of our members. There are a number of other topics we can also discuss if there's interest during the question and answer session, such as the changes um, that occurred um, in high stakes exams like board examinations or other changes um, in undergraduate and graduate medical education, like those related to the interview process um, for admission to medical school or to matching into residencies and fellowships. So if we look back um, to March of 2020, very little was known um, by us and, and by many about COVID-19 and the lasting effects the pandemic would have globally, including the current surge attributable to the Delta variant and the continued constraints promulgated by measures to stop the spread of the COVID and mitigate the toll on hospital systems and healthcare workers. Um, as we discussed earlier um, in the session, the notion of well-being and resilience and minimizing burnout among healthcare professionals is also at the forefront. And we are mindful of the things that we have to do to support surgeons um, caring for surgical patients, as well as carrying forward the, um, the education. So like many other US-based uh, organizations, the ACS followed the guidance of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, the CDC, and other bodies to guide our decision-making regarding clinical Congress and other meetings. Some of our challenges, um, at the outset, uh, the college's executive leadership, the Board of Regents, and key staff met on a regular basis to assess the ever-evolving situation and make decisions regarding the status of clinical Congress. Depending on the um, deciding on the status of a meeting held in October was difficult because we didn't really know how the pandemic would evolve. And we partnered closely with integrated communications with others um, around the world to think also about 
travel constraints for our international members who may not have been able to travel as freely as pre-pandemic and how to assure that we were sharing um, information uh, worldwide. We established a regular cadence for communication to ensure all attendees understood um, what the constraints were. And in fact, uh, moved from our uh, bulletin, which is our monthly magazine to a bulletin brief, which in the beginning was three times a week, not only for our members, but for surgeons and non-surgeons uh, worldwide, pulling together all of the, uh, the latest data, the latest information on what uh, should be done uh, based on data and on science, up to and including the appropriate way to step back um, elective surgeries when that was an appropriate decision. Um, Real-time adaptation of new technology. Like many organizations, the ACS pivoted quickly to evaluating virtual platforms and learning management systems that could accommodate the number of tracks or named lectures, panel sessions, scientific forums um, held at clinical congress or held to share information about COVID and non-COVID activities um, and to create a seamless experience. So in our evaluation, we also had to consider integrations with our databases and our IT infrastructure, which was necessary to occur in relatively short order to customize the platform to specific needs. And we also had to be mindful of the learning curve of attendees to um, navigate the interface of this new platform, building this together um, along with our leadership and advocacy conference, um, general surgery review courses, which are held around the world, um, and morphing those into an effective online delivery system that could be launched on a virtual platform. It's also difficult to replicate the in-person experience virtually. Um, its Clinical Congress usually hosts a significant number of networking um, events that further relationships and lead to real-time, um, in-time meetings and foster collaborations among surgeons. Um, and we are increasing um, those types of networking events virtually um, and in our many regional um, and international chapter meetings. Another uh, element uh, that needed to be uh, converted was that we offer uh, some uh, significant number of scholarships for surgeons to attend clinical congress or to attend other surgical education events around the world, including one, for example, specifically dedicated to a surgeon from Greece, uh, thanks to the generosity of the Nearcos Foundation. So these scholarships provide um, invaluable opportunities for networking and learning at the meetings. And um, all of those scholarships, um, unfortunately, right now are on hold, although we have morphed as many of them as possible to, um, to an online relationship. But the ones that are a travel award, um, we hope to soon reestablish. Some of the opportunities, however, that we're mindful of making sure uh, we availed ourselves um, were really the real-time learning opportunities. So the pandemic provided an opportunity for surgeons to realize the dynamic nature of medical knowledge, appreciate how mastery of these key concepts are essential to respond to a novel threat to human health. Um, Clinical Congress uh, featured several panel sessions, special sessions, late breaking sessions um, on everything from uh, testing to um, vaccine development. And we've had some really robust discussions about that so far this afternoon and aspects of those disease uh, processes in real time. And beyond Clinical Congress, um, we hosted several COVID-specific education webinars through Zoom for the global surgical community, making sure that the bar um, to participation was set quite low, mindful that in some of our um, more remote regions, um, there is difficulty really even accessing um, online platforms. We really wanted to make this um, easy and accessible um, to all, both during Clinical Congress and in other settings. Um, there was a, a thoughtful approach to blending both synchronous and asynchronous learning. And so the transition to a virtual meeting allowed asynchronous learning, which accommodates um, one, learning styles, uh, two, geographical uh, distribution of our attendees, time demands um, for busy practicing surgeons, and the ability to consume even more content uh, so that concurrent sessions were not a barrier uh, to being able to participate. Um, I think the future of Clinical Congress and our other ACS meetings will be hybrid in some capacity, allowing this ability to blend um, the synchronous and asynchronous learning to meet the evolving needs of surgeons. Um, this coming uh, meeting in just a month or two will also include didactic courses um, and surgical skills courses, um, and we are continuing to work on ways that the hands-on element can indeed be uh, maintained even in a virtual platform. 
transitioning Clinical Congress to a virtual platform did allow um, almost 8,000 international fellows uh, more access to Clinical Congress. We have never in the past had that many of our international colleagues able to participate um, in person. So um, that was indeed a, a silver lining uh, to uh, a most thorny problem. Last year, uh, the meeting itself was completely free to make sure that there was access, again, to those from um, low and moderate income countries who might have seen the uh, registration fees as barriers and um, wanting to be mindful to allow all of our, uh, our worldwide uh, colleagues to participate. Um, beyond Clinical Congress, um, certainly a transition to online um, education for many um, is in the hybrid format is important to increase reach, promote more involvement, um, and promote equity uh, in education. And there is a set uh, committee on surgical resident selection, a summit on training across the surgical special specialties, and fundamentals um, of assessment for surgical faculty programs that are new initiatives that will continue to provide a future direction. Um, I did want to spend just a few moments talking about um, Operation Giving Back as we are reflecting on um, the ways that we support, uh, again, our, our uh, low and moderate income country colleagues. Um, so the inception of Operation Giving Back, um, which dates back to 2004, um, chaired by the, one of the previous presidents, um, Andy Warshaw, who may be known to some of you from Boston, um, OGB, or Operation Giving Back, has made significant contributions to the field of global surgical outreach programs particularly as it relates to education um, and uh, clinical uh, support, serving as a resource center for fellow members of the college who are engaged in uh, volunteerism and humanitarian work across the globe. And over the years, we've partnered with several um, humanitarian organizations and country-specific surgical societies um, to uh, have an impact. And since 2016, after the World Health Organization a report and resolution to include surgery as a component of universal health coverage, there's been significant renewed interest um, from students, from residents, from faculty, from fellows um, in private practice and academia to be involved in global outreach programs to help um, those who are underserved. And recognizing this, um, the regions of the college working together with surgical um, organizations around the world have really focused on um, in particular in Sub-Saharan Africa, but certainly um, will continue to expand that work around the globe to make sure that we are um, working effectively to, um, to care for surgical patients and raise um, educational opportunities for those um, who may not otherwise have access. So we've developed close partnerships with the College of East, Central, and Southern Africa, COSEXA. Um, the COSEXA region has over 400 to 500 million population with a surgeon to population ratio of only about 0.5 to 100,000 uh, patients. Moreover, uh, women made up only 6% of the surgical workforce, and so increasing the number of surgeons overall, and in addition, in particular, the number of women surgeons in the region is one of the priorities of COSEXA. And as such, our ACS COSEXA partnership um, has developed a women scholars program created in 2017 and we've supported uh, 47 young women to pursue a career in surgery, individuals who will remain um, in country and bring forward um, the educational opportunities and the patient care. Um, in addition, educational resources are being made available for free to surgical trainees in um, low and, and uh, moderate, low middle income countries. And ACS has supported some of these priorities such as leadership training, quality education, uh, twinning uh, with some of the ACS journals, recruitment of external examiners for um, examinations, um, and other initiatives. The final thing I'll add is that for many years, there hasn't been really a coordinated effort to provide um, surgical education and clinical care in that region. And this work in silos has led to some duplication of efforts and perhaps um, even a waste of some resources. So Operation Giving Back has developed an infrastructure to coordinate efforts by creating a consortium of surgical departments interested in global surgery. And we collectively have worked together to develop a surgical training hub, uh, the first in Hawassa, um, in uh, Ethiopia, currently 13 US institutions are participating, um, the next in Lusaka, Zambia, with some 11 uh, US institutions participating. And we are now um, in the midst of developing um, a surg surgery specialty focused partnership um, beginning with cardiothoracic and vascular, 
then moving to plastics and maxillofacial surgery, and finally trauma and trauma systems development in uh, Kigali, uh, Rwanda. So again, our goal is to try to be as uh, broad reaching as possible um, as it relates to work around education, surgical didactic sessions for residents, journal clubs, um, research, so online research methodology courses, um, resident mentorship and research efforts, joint manuscript writing and publications. I'm um, in the quality arena, um, developing, developing and participating in morbidity and mortality conferences, development of patient databases and operation uh, reports, um, in trauma online uh, training, uh, de developed um, in the ACS, but delivered at multiple locations, building on ATLS, which is well known to many, and planning um, to assess trauma system and create a tool that will allow, again, partnership with uh, surgeons in country, and then, of course, uh, clinical care. Um, so with that, um, I will uh, stop. Thank you very much for your attention, and I would be pleased uh, to answer any questions at the appropriate time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patricia, for this very comprehensive presentation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, and in particular, uh, particular, all your international programs, including the women's surgeon program. Uh, so th we, we should give more emphasis on gender dimensions when we talk about not only surgical education, but medical education and healthcare education in general. Thank you very much again. Uh, our next speaker uh, is Zoe Rapti, who is the Deputy Minister of Health in Greece. Unfortunately, uh, Mrs. Rapti is unable to join us today, but we have a pre-recorded presentation by her. Dear all, Your Excellency, WHO Regional Director for Europe, Dr. Kluge, Alternate Minister of Health, Dr. Gaga, Honorable Rector of the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, Dr. Papayoanu, esteemed professors of the Greek diaspora, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in, a, in the Aristotle Medical Forum session facing the pandemic focus and focus on well-being. I would like to congratulate the School of Medicine of the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki for their initiative and to wish every success in the endeavor. It is a great honor to work alongside with esteemed professors from the Greek diaspora, the WHO, and the mental health professionals of the country on the crucial matters that the pandemic has brought to light in the health sector and especially in mental health. As Procrates stated 2,500 years ago, every disease starts from the soul. To this direction, in 1948, WHO defines health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. This puts mental health as a top priority, not only for governments, but also for societies as well. Mental health remains a key concern in Greece. The economic crisis of the recent years and the pandemic have led to a significant increase in psychological issues and disorders and exacerbated existing inequalities regarding the accessibility of mental health services. The pandemic has brought sweeping changes in all people's lives in a way that put us in a survival mode. It is essential though to start thinking how to re-establish the concept of well-being in our lives. In this frame, it is important to promote the global and wider development of people, their health and mental health and eventually well-being for the whole population. There is a need to strengthen the evidence-based approach towards establishing quality prevention and response services to advance mental health according to the needs of each target group. And this must be done with the optimal utilization of resources. An additional feature of the pandemic is that not everyone is equally affected. 
the mental health burden is much higher and the poor to the poor and vulnerable groups. Bringing to the surface inequalities in the population that already existed. This is also reflected in the unequal distribution of mental health services across the country. To respond to these challenges, significant steps have been taken so far by the Greek government during the COVID-19 pandemic. Psychosocial support through telecounseling for COVID-19 patients in the hospitals, as well as their families and the staff of, the, of our hospitals. The hotline 10306 for psychosocial support to COVID-19 patients, their families and the general population. Development of the information system of the National Health Service BI for Health that ensures the collection, processing and dissemination of data of the public health unit, creation of a digital map in mental health services all around Greece that facilitates, facilitates the citizens' access to mental health services, development of mental health facilities for children and adolescents all over the country, and also units for early intervention in psychosis that will be developed in the near future throughout Greece. Also, integration of mental health in primary health care with the development of telepsychiatry network in collaboration with the private and public sector with the aim to provide exactly psychiatric services and psychosocial support to adults, children and adolescents that live in remote areas of Greece. A telepsychiatrist unit has already been set up and operates on the island of Castellorizo. Development also of psychiatric services and community units for dementia patients throughout the country. And of course, unfortunately, on top of the pandemic, Greece has been going through a quite challenging period of wildfires. In order to take immediate actions, the Ministry of Health provided psychosocial support for fire, for fire victims, both on the spot as well as with tele-psychosocial support through the hotline 10306. Although the challenges were immense due to the pandemic, the Ministry of Health continued to strategically plan the future of the mental health system in Greece. In collaboration with WHO, we conducted a joint review of the current state of mental health services in Greece that will contribute to the improvement of our mental health system. The joint review led to the creation of the National Mental Health Committee, the members of which were assigned to work on the National Mental Health Action Plan for the next decade, 2021-2030. In the direction of promoting mental well-being, WHO, under the leadership of Regional Director Dr. Kluge and the support of the Hellenic Republic in Greece, launched during the pandemic, a new, a new sub-regional office in the country focusing on quality of care and patient safety. This was done in alignment with the European Programme of Work 2025 United Action for Better Health. Moreover, our tireless efforts to overcome the severe consequences of the pandemic and create a social network of mental health services across Europe led to the Athens Mental Health Summit 2021 and the adoption of the Athens Declaration, which formed a stepping stone of the implementation of the European Framework for Action of the WHO European Region and the WHO Mental Health Coalition. Thanking you once again for your invitation. I wish you every success to the Global Initiative of the School of Medicine of the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki and may it continue working in the years to come. Thank you very much. 
So we thank the Minister for her intervention, uh, particularly focusing on issues on mental health and well-being. I would like to invite our next speaker, Dr. Mario Stemistokleos, who is the Secretary for Primary Care at the Ministry of Health in Athens in Greece. Dr. Themistokleos uh, is the leading expert and the leading government official in implementing the successful vaccination program in Greece. Dr. Themistokleos, we're looking forward to your presentation. Uh, I would like to, uh, good afternoon to everybody. I would like to thank Professor Mosilis and especially uh, Professor Ansasialis for the invitation to be here with you. Uh, <laughs> I would like to speak. My presentation will be focused mostly on in Greece and how the implementation of uh, the vaccination uh, program. And I would like to uh, especially express my respect to the science, the previous speakers' science, as uh, Ms. Kubman, uh, Mr. Kiratsis, and uh, Mr. Bulas, who play a crucial role facing the pandemic uh, worldwide. Uh, we will all agree. Uh, that uh, the vaccines is the only efficient way uh, to fight the pandemic. Uh, vaccines, and in the past, in human history, and in the medicine, in history of medicine, was the way to deal with diseases that play a crucial role and infected probably million or even billion of peoples uh, for decades or centuries. Uh, we see that uh, we managed to fight pandemics in the past with the vaccines, and we can see the effect of the vaccines, uh, vaccines that they uh, could uh, research and have vaccines in a tremendous short period of time, just one year after the first case. And we see the effect of the vaccines uh, even in the pandemic fighting COVID. And we see the difference between the, uh, the, the, the first wave, the second wave, and especially the third wave that even we have a lot of cases, even here in Greece, we have a, uh, a specific decrease in the cases of hospitalization and, and deaths and people in ICU. So while we focus how was the vaccination program was rolled out in Greece and the implementation and how we started, we started thinking about the vaccination program in, in uh, late August, early September. And the decision is that because it was a huge program, we realized from the beginning it was uh, not just the Ministry of Health, but a lot of other ministries and organizations, public and private uh, companies uh, should be cooperate, coordinate together in order to work in this program and to facing all the unknown factors uh, because in the early September or even in uh, early October, we didn't know uh, factors as the uh, specific condition of storage, uh, distributions of vaccines, expiration days, even the amounts we are going to receive and when we are going to receive the, the quantities of the vaccines. So the first decision in the government was to create a structure uh, that could work horizontally between all the ministries, all the uh, involved uh, ministries. We have uh, four actually ministers that they were uh, energetically involved in the vaccination program, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Digital Governance, Ministry of Civil Protection, and Ministry of Defense. And we have uh, seven other uh, public companies, public organizations that they were involved, and several private companies. So uh, the first step, and actually this is the, the biggest, and for my opinion, uh, the biggest successful example of what we call the executive state of the Epitelico Kratos, what we call in Greece, that all these organizations, they were gathered in one place, in, uh, in one building, so these, all these people could uh, cooperate between each other and decisions to be taken uh, within minutes or hours and bypass all the bureaucratic procedures that we are quite famous here in Greece. So all these organizations, they were moved in the building of civil protections. Uh, and uh, I was uh, appointed as the project manager, the coordinator of, of all the whole organization. And so when we started the, the planning of the, uh, the vaccination program, uh, we, we based everything in three pillars. The first pillar was safety. Uh, we knew that we have to uh, storage, distribute uh, the vaccination, and all the procedure has to follow the GTPs, 
or for the companies or for the people that they were involved. And so we take especially measures and we standardize all the procedures because imagine that now even we, have, we are doing 20 or 25 vaccinations per day, almost 5,000 people every day are working in the vaccination programs. And we are the days in May that we are 100 vaccinations per day, that almost uh, eight or 9,000 people were working every day for the vaccination. So the second pillar was the quality of service. Uh, here in Greece, we don't have a good reputation of providing, especially the public sector, the national health system, of uh, great, of good quality service and in, uh, in almost all the activities. So we have to plan everything uh, from the scratch, make the, all the uh, procedure of the vaccination very simple in order to be adapted uh, in very quick way in all the people uh, that we are going to be uh, involved in the vaccination. Uh, so all the staff, all, all the staff that was involved was trained uh, by video uh, sessions and uh, everyone that has to work in a vaccination center or in all other aspects, the distribution, the storage of the vaccine has to be trained and the, the, the box to be checked by us in order to give permission uh, to proceed. And the third pillar was this transparency that we know that we didn't have all the information uh, regarding the vaccines. It was a new product, a new drug. Uh, and that we have to inform uh, people, the society, in a way uh, that uh, we ensure the, the transparency. And uh, so we establish a, a standard press conference every Monday uh, in order to address all uh, the things. And in my opinion, I believe that we managed to handle very difficult ma uh, matters as the AstraZeneca vaccines and the different decisions between uh, countries. So, uh, to the previous one. Sorry for that. I would like to say before to come to this, that in order to provide a good quality of service, we have to digitalize all the procedure from A to Z. Uh, this, this was something that was the first time happening uh, in the national health system, that everything was digitalized from the uh, fridge in the storage house that the vaccines were, uh, from up to the uh, reminder, an SMS reminder to the, uh, to the citizen uh, for the vaccination appointment in the next days. So everything was digitalized in the procedure. Uh, we use tablets, every vaccination center has tablet, and this actually is something that uh, was very well uh, adapted by the health system, by people working in the health uh, sector, and uh, uh, people that were very familiar, uh, the citizens, that they managed to uh, book an appointment through the platform or even people that they have uh, older people to book an appointment in a pharmacist. So when I will come back to, uh, or even questions after that. So where we stand now, now we have the 60% 60, 60 of the population in Greece vaccinated with at least one dose. Uh, this is somewhere between almost more than 68, 70% of the adult population uh, in Greece uh, fully vaccinated, uh, receive at least one dose. And uh, our forecast still the end of September, although it is changing every day because we have around 20 or 25 new appointments every day. We will uh, be on the end of September if we have no, uh, no more uh, new appointments in the system, it will be around 72%. Uh, percent. If the questions, are we happy with that? If I'm happy with that, mm -hmm. if I'm answered as a project manager of the uh, operation uh, Freedom, the answer is yes. We, uh, when we started this, we wouldn't expect that seven out seven or even eight out of 10 people in Greece, we will get vaccinated. Uh, if you ask me as a doctor, uh, if this enough, the answer is no. We need more people, especially with the Delta variant, in order to uh, be protected and uh, to fight efficiently uh, the pandemic. So we have to 
take measures to pursue more people uh, to get uh, vaccinated. Uh, we can see here that Greece is somewhere in the average of the European countries. It's what the socialists say, Greece is better than the uh, Balkan countries and the uh, previous Eastern uh, European countries, but it's worse uh, in the uh, is worse than the Western uh, European countries. So uh, what's going to be the next day? I would like to say here that the Operation Freedom, the vaccination program, uh, has a very uh, positive uh, adoption from the Greek society. Uh, actually, it's uh, in the polls we see that the positive opinion again, uh, uh, with the vac for the vaccination program is was the same as the uh, Olympic Games in 2000. Four. It's almost more than 95% 95, uh, 95 in every poll uh, since we measure uh, the public opinion. And uh, the, I think this is, uh, shows us the way for the next day, uh, shows us the, uh, the way for the reform of the primary health care. We have achieved some uh, things in the vaccination program that it's our duty to use them for the next day. The first thing is the complete digitalization of the uh, national health system, the primary health care. We have to implement as soon as possible uh, the electronic health record. Uh, we have to implement uh, the electronic appointments. We use that in the vaccination program, so it's very easy to adapt this in the primary health care. Uh, we train people using uh, the electronic appointments uh, for the vaccination, so we can use this uh, an online appointment booking system from the primary health care. We, uh, we prove that we can work in uh, good quality services, in safety, uh, to standardize all procedures and to retrain the personnel in the private health uh, care and to uh, uh, describe an exact pathway uh, a patient or a citizen will follow from the diagnosis, the treatment, uh, the treatment in the primary health care, the treatment in, uh, in the secondary health care in hospital, and then the, uh, 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 the go back to the community and go back to the primary health uh, care. So we can, uh, we are going to use all our experience in the vaccination program uh, to make a pathway and especially to make a cooperation between the private and the public uh, the public care, the private and the, and the public companies in order to achieve a good uh, result. Thanks a lot for your attention. And I will answer questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Themistocleos, for this very comprehensive presentation and for discussing all the challenges involved in implementing the vaccination program in our, our country. So the next and final speaker for of the first session is Mari Yeroyani, who is a senior expert in innovating cities and she is based at the European Commission Director General for Research and Innovation. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we, we cannot hear you, yeah. I I think you should unmute okay. your, yeah, okay. Yes, okay, I did. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, as I'm the last speaker, I'm going to, to, to provide technical, uh, more technical and practical uh, expertise with regards to this issue. Uh, I work as a senior expert in the Director General for Research Innovation for the European Commission, dealing with uh, urban mobility, urban issues and mobility and coordinating the file of cities across the Directorate General. Uh, the latest developments on the future activities of cities, focusing also on healthy cities, as this issue continues to be of primary importance for us. First of all, uh, cities and urban development have received uh, the biggest attention through significant EU funds, uh, of uh, almost 3.1 billion euro during the framework program uh, of research and innovation Horizon 2020. This EU funding covered health and well-being in cities uh, using technological 
and solutions based on nature um, and also promoting a cross-sectorial and holistic approach. So looking at the city as, uh, as an ecosystem where all sectors intersect, like climate resilience, urban mobility, reduction of emissions and pollution, health and well-being, social inclusion, social innovation, circular economy. To share all these wonderful and valuable results with the urban community and with all stakeholders interested in, uh, in uh, the results and tools and innovative solutions produced uh, through this uh, significant uh, EU funding, we did a mapping of all cities and research institutions which received research innovation funds through the Framework Programme Horizon 2020 as well, we also mapped all the existing EU national and international networks and platforms and EU international initiatives uh, um, which exist to help our stakeholders, to help all the scientific community share the results, but also have the possibility and opportunity to uh, participate in the networking and approach and uh, be able to, to participate and um, be part of this uh, call for proposals, as we call them under the new framework programs. Uh, in practical terms, these research innovation projects uh, where research and institutions, but also cities, municipalities can participate, uh, are large demonstration projects in the order of 10 to 15 million euro, with a consortium of almost 30, 35 partners inviting uh, different stakeholders, like, as I said, universities, cities, municipalities, research institutes, small, medium enterprises, innovation firms, consultants, civil society, NGOs, citizens. And so these projects put together 100 stakeholders to work on a certain issue, like is health and well-being, mental health, uh, uh, where the, the methodologies uh, are tested and co-created with the citizens and are tested in real envir environments, not in a laboratory, so in the city real environments. Uh, to 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 have an uh, uh, to to get acquainted with uh, this uh, huge knowledge existing basis of solutions networks coordinators projects, uh, I would invite you and I will put this in the chat to see this mapping report is edition 2021. We did it during the pandemic uh, period, so it's a concrete example of how we turn uh, the challenges of COVID into opportunities uh, to help the post-COVID recovery. So I'm going to share this. Uh, healthy cities continue to be a priority challenge in Horizon Europe, the new framework program, where, as I said, the citizens are in the process, in the center of the whole process of innovating uh, and regenerating existing cities and designing new cities and neighborhoods. So in this sense, we are launching on 22 September a mission on cities. It's the Horizon Europe Cities mission to achieve the first 100 climate neutral cities by 2030 and even more uh, to use these cities as test beds to achieve the, by 2050 the rest of the European cities to become climate neutral um, uh, because this contributes uh, reduction of emissions, clean cities uh, contributes to health and well-being and, of course, mental health. Um, um, so, in this, in this sense, uh, we are amending, uh, we are launching call for proposals under Horizon uh, Europe and we are amending uh, the work program 2021-2022 with, uh, with new opportunities to submit as uh, as universities, as research institutes, as cities, municipalities. So this is open for all interested uh, stakeholders, city stakeholders. And uh, the, the new topics that uh, we are uh, promoting is our topics to achieve inclusive, healthy, just, sustainable, resilient cities. So resilient, uh, climate resilient cities, but also health resilient cities. Uh, we will be launching a call for expression this November to address cities that are interested to 
participate in this process. And uh, I would like to, to also mention here as uh, one of my conclusive points that the existing projects of Horizon 2020 on health and well-being uh, clustered. Uh, and so we have a wonderful clustering of almost 12 uh, health projects dealing with health issues on all the spectrum of health uh, to help the post-recovery phases for cities. So 1,200 stakeholders are about to sign a manifesto to promote healthy, socially inclusive, beautiful aesthetic cities with the aim to uh, address this the, the post-COVID period and to turn opportunities, uh, to turn challenges into and problems into opportunities for the citizens. Uh, this manifesto promotes human and planetary health, uh, suggests an ecological mapping of cities. It promotes also inclusion of inhabitants, not only citizens, uh, 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 all, all citizens, but also social groups challenged social groups that will be engaged are migrants and refugees. It supports digital and technological aspects, the cultural dimension of health and well-being. And uh, we, we are about to, um, to, to draft the action plan and to launch actions that will follow this manifesto. And uh, so one could ask, how can I be informed on all these tools, on this uh, on this huge knowledge base uh, that exists from the European Commission? How a city mayor can be aware to take stock of the existing uh, of these existing actions of existing solutions that have been uh, proposed to lead his city towards innovation, health, and well-being? A good means. Uh, is the new city science initiative is a new initiative that we are launching with our joint research center and this initiative supports science evidence policy making so simply strengthens the science dimension of the city to address problems to address challenges to address a pandemic um, the aim of this city science initiative is to create a network of science municipality advisors to raise awareness of EU science results, to connect cities with universities, with policy making, and to have just-in-time solutions to use in a case of a crisis like the present uh, the, the COVID crisis that we have been through. Uh, I'm going to share this uh, initiative and you, you can join this initiative. One of the labs of this initiative is the is Thessaloniki, the city of Thessaloniki, leading uh, the mental health lab and health and well-being. And uh, the aim is to uh, there. There were several events uh, putting together stakeholders uh, to address the post-recovery crisis towards a socially inclusive, healthy, and prosperous city. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, very comprehensive presentation on uh, the role of the European Commission in this particular area on innovating cities. Uh, we'll now have a series of five uh, interventions uh, by leading experts and academics uh, in Greece and who will reflect on the presentations of our eminent speakers. And we'll start with Dr. Joao Breda, who is the acting director of the WHO office in Athens in Greece. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Elias Muzialas. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Greetings from, from Athens, where in fact we are establishing this uh, and implementing this new center which is uh, uh, supported by the Greek government. And uh, first of all, we are really grateful and delighted for that support. And we believe that this is the first and the leading center in the context of WHO that would, would definitely bring the issue of quality of care again back to the center of what we are doing. But before I make my very short reflections, which will be no more than a simple, in a simple nutshell, I think that con congratulations are already are in order because this is already a very successful conference from what I have seen today. 
Therefore, I would like to greet uh, the representatives of the medical school of the Aristotle University, University the Honorable Rector, Professor Anastasiades, and, and of course, it's a great pleasure to be moderated by Professor, Professor Mutialos. I would like also to share with you that my colleague, Dr. Pablo Theodorakis, he was supposed to be with us in this uh, session today, is following uh, the web stream, but they had problems with connection and he, he would not be able to deliver his comment. So we would, I would do it, uh, let's say, together. After the speech of so many great speeches and, and presentations and the speech of our regional director, I don't think there is much else to be said, but I dare to uh, underline and eventually highlight some of the topics that really struck me um, decisively, uh, decisively in this, uh, in this, during uh, this session. And I have basically, if you allow me, five points. I would like to bring to the discussion. One is really on what COVID has unveiled, undercovered, and it finally highlighted the importance of health and, and well being. I would say that never before, like today, well being is definitely so important uh, for um, those working in health, health professionals, but also for the citizens. And we have seen really challenges for um, healthy life that were posed by COVID, uh, by COVID in a very systemic fashion, from issues with access to food, with the lockdowns and changes, really serious changes in food systems. Uh, alcohol consumption, uh, there are reports of increase, smoking, difficulties in access to physical activity, for example, or the issues around mental health, which were so extensively and nicely described by most of the speakers and particularly by Deputy Minister Rapti. So this has been really a time where also the provision of care, particularly for those diseases, illnesses that affect us more and are the major killers, like cardiovascular diseases or cancer, those uh, care services, they were really seriously affected. We are still recovering uh, from the backlog, and it's a big challenge that we are really facing. So in terms of the situation analysis, I think it was really well done, and all these, these areas related with well-being, they were very much uh, highlighted by all the speakers. On the other four points, I would like to take maybe a forward uh, looking uh, perspective. Something I really enjoyed was the reference that Professor Muzial has made to One Health. One Health has been discussed in the context of WHO and other UN agencies for a long time, but now with COVID we see that we need to have a holistic perspective, that we need to look at forests, as we look at cities, at wildlife, as we look at um, you know the animal production, we need to link all of this seriously. Uh, with health as well. And that that shows that now is the time to do it. So the One Health approach, I would really like to support very, that very important uh, suggestion, which is, of course, part of, um, you know, important reports like, and what the Commission, Monty Commission has also discussed. My third point will be very much on the opportunities. There are great opportunities for innovation here. Of course, needless to say, the digital transformation is there, but it should go beyond, literally beyond telemedicine. We need to use the digital opportunities also uh, for prevention. We need to use it also to reflect on the protection in the digital sphere. We have seen, for example, the increase of uh, the promotion of unhealthy foods, of alcohol, the use of digital opportunities by the tobacco industry, and this is clearly unacceptable and we need to seize the opportunities to advance the digital transformation, but also to protect more particularly our children and young people. Urban design, it was discussed, cities, all this innovation also bringing together food systems transformation is hand in hand with health transformation that we need. And we need to do it really in, in, in tandem. So the holistic perspective I think is, is very, very important. 
fourth point is really on data. This is a forum with lots of scientists and really great scientists. I'm so impressed. I was already impressed with the Greek diaspora, seeing it working, you know, in reality. Uh, it, it's really amazing. Um, and uh, here, we really, we really need more research, of course, and better research and better ways of looking into, uh, looking into data, artificial intelligence, more use. It's not more data related with disease, we need that, of course, but more data related with health. And that is something that we all need to move together forward. This is why we are so delighted to start discussing this new collaborating center at the university there, which is going to really focus on uh, on well-being from nutrition to mental health, if you will. And trust in science is very important. And what you've done today is really a contribution to trust in science. Final point, coming back to health systems. The future of the public health actors and predictioners of the future, they cannot be the same as the past. They need more and other types of skills. Leading with misinformation is something that our profession, health uh, and public health predictioners, they are not used to do that. And we really need a new public health in my perspective as well, building on the resilience of primary health care. And this is really my final note, the resilience of primary health care, which is central for everything we are discussing here. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Joao, for outlining these uh, key priorities and issues from a WHO perspective, particularly focusing on the own health perspective and the digital applications and the need to strengthen health systems to improve resilience. Uh, we'll have time to discuss all the issue, these issues later in the Q&A session. But I would like now to introduce our next speaker, Professor Sotirios Tsiodras, who does not need a special introduction. Uh, he's a, a distinguished professor of infectious diseases at the University of Athens and has played the leading role in the management of the pandemic uh, in our country. Uh, professor Tsiodras, it's a great honor to have you here with us today. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Professor Moshilis, for the nice words and the introduction. Uh, dear esteemed colleagues, professors and chairs of uh, this session on facing the pandemic and uh, uh, the focus being the well-being of the population that is part of uh, this first Aristotle Medical Forum, uh, I would like to thank you very much for the honor to speak before your esteemed panel of presenters in attendance. Uh, Greece, along the rest of the world, is confronting the heavy burden of COVID-19 on people, healthcare workers, the health system and society as a whole, who have experienced what the virus is capable of doing, how fast it can spread in vulnerable populations and how it can chew up the capacity of our health system, both at the local and the national level. Flexibility and sustainability of care, as already mentioned, remain essential parts of the response. As scientists, we did not shy away from the opportunity to conduct research, to understand and develop ways to fight the new virus causing this pandemic. From basic science and biology to epidemiological and clinical, namely to the bedside applied research, we have all seen the fruits of this tireless effort, especially in the availability of efficient vaccines and other new technologies presented herein. The new technologies used to make the vaccine and monoclonal antibodies will help medical science not only to fight pandemics, but also to fight other diseases such as HIV and cancer. The inequity in distribution of vaccines at a global level needs to be addressed urgently. I'm afraid that this will haunt us in the future and will continue to affect access to life-saving medicine or preventive vaccines that will result from scientific advances that we owe to and have seen because of the pandemic. A united Europe of research, a united world of research is key to respond to epidemics and pandemics threatening the planet. Several regulatory, legal and financial hurdles have significantly slowed down the efficient conduct of clinical trials over the past months. Something unacceptable with the raging pandemic. Adaptive large clinical trials during pandemics 
should be considered a critical countermeasure like vaccines. And the regulatory approval pace should be consistent with this situation of urgency. Several challenges still remain and will still have to be addressed. We still face them and deal them as scientists and public health servants. And we'll continue to do so in the immediate and the distant future. Among this non-inclusive list, I put the consequences of the pandemic and the corresponding challenges for the health system from primary to tertiary care, the need to upgrade global health services, for example, the strengthening of telemedicine, especially in low-income countries, especially for vulnerable groups of the population who are most affected, the current lack of successful therapies for use in primary health care for a disease with very serious complications, especially for the vulnerable populations, is a, a, a huge problem and continues to be one. The existence of long-term complications from the disease, even in younger populations, recent data unfortunately indicates significant problems. We need to follow up on this. We need to have more science involved in dealing with this, in studying this, in addressing this. Communication at the patient's bedside with their loved ones. That was an issue that was often overlooked, needs to be part of the standard of care. The effectiveness of restrictive and other public health preventive measures, taking into account the existence of complications stemming from these measures, such as the impact on education, the development of children, the impact on care of other diseases, the impact on mental health that was already mentioned, should be thoroughly assessed together with further social, economical and political implications and effects of those restrictive measures on the society as a whole. Our preparedness to deal with new pandemics and the need for a coordinated response to similar crises threatening our planet, like climate change and the destruction of the natural environment. The current pandemic, unfortunately, has been the result of failures in responding at all critical junctions of global preparedness and response. Unfortunately, we still observe an unbalanced global burden that we will need to address at the aftermath of this pandemic. Of course, the existence of multiple bioethical issues and problems resulting from some of the obligatory measures and campaigns to get our life back, uh, the need for social cohesion and solidarity in dealing with the pandemic. I want to emphasize some problems with risk communication and the systematic dissemination of false news, as well as the very frequent lack of adequate and scientifically substantiated and understandable to the lay public communication. This hugely jeopardizes the efforts to combat the pandemic. Communication of research findings to the general public and reliable indicators of its effectiveness are lagging behind basic science research. All of this communication and miscommunication may hurt science and the public's perception of it. At the same time, the pandemic has simulated the interest of the public in the sciences, the national healthcare the healthcare system and the related public health actions. In this environment, there is a chance for the scientific community to speak up more, to increase the knowledge of the public in basic scientific concepts as they relate not only to infectious disease, but to other enemies of our well being. In its own way, the pandemic will hopefully be an opportunity for large scale interventions to improve public health in general not only in our country, but in the entire world. Science remains a key player by providing solutions that sometimes appear to come almost in real time. I hope that the appreciation and real life benefits of all this amazing scientific work that we have witnessed during the last year and a half will influence investment in research infrastructure in the immediate future, both in our country and elsewhere. This will lead to new discoveries and knowledge, which are expected to bring significant long-term beneficial effects for our health and public health in general. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Professor Teodras, for this excellent and uh, very comprehensive presentation outlining key achievements in terms of regulatory changes, but also challenges 
challenges we're going to face with the health system, societal challenges, and uh, then your final uh, remarks on risk communication and the role of science and risk assessment, uh, which are uh, very important in terms of uh, managing the pandemic, and in particular your remarks about the need to invest more in science. And this is what the European Commission is, has been doing lately with the introduction of HERA, the Health Emergency and Response Authority. Uh, much remains to be defined, of course, in terms of how this organization is going to be shaped, but it's going to offer uh, additional opportunities for research and investment uh, in the area of infectious diseases and hopefully going beyond infectious diseases. Thank you very much again, and we'll have the opportunity to discuss some of these issues in our Q&A session. Our next uh, speaker is uh, Professor Konstantinos Fodoulakis, who is uh, an expert in mental health and psychiatry and has published extensively on issues related to mental health and the pandemic. Konstantinos, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Moschelos. Thank you for inviting me to be here uh, with us. Uh, I was asked to present our uh, work during the pandemic concerning uh, issues of mental health for the general population, but also concerning uh, special populations like uh, people working in the health sector. Now, uh, our uh, work group has uh, established a large collaboration uh, network, uh, including uh, 40 countries, uh, and uh, launched the uh, COVID-19 Mental Health International for the General Population Study, which uh, uh, is called the Comet G study. It included, as uh, said, uh, 40 countries and uh, around uh, 55,000 uh, responses. It uh, uh, resulted in the estimation of uh, around 17% of clinical depression. We utilized an advanced algorithm, not, not only uh, a cutoff point of a scale, but uh, an advanced algorithm and uh, it resulted in 17% of clinical depression, which is not less, if, if we standardize it, it's not less than 12%. If this is so, then during the pandemic in general, during the last year with ups and downs in, uh, in the pandemic with waves and with ups and downs in, in measures taken, uh, the population experienced at least double rates of clinical depression. And on top of that, it was around 15% of uh, extreme distress, which did not reach the, the levels of clinical depression, but still a large percentage of the population was extremely stressed, which if you add these two rates, you end up with uh, approximately one third to one half of the population being either depressed or, um, or severely distressed, which is uh, an extreme burden on the population. And we anticipated it more or less but we hadn't measured it until now. And the question is, is this horizontal? Or there are some vulnerable, population, uh, vulnerable groups in the population that are unequally uh, affected by the problem. Uh, it seems that uh, the most vulnerable to experience depression and stress are people with some kind of uh, mental health history, but still a large percentage of the population still to be uh, under uh, extreme pressure concerning its mental health. Uh, the second study we did in the same frame, the Comet S for university students, uh, gathered data from around 13,000 university students for, from 12 countries. And it seems that the same results apply here with the asterisk that uh, university students uh, had higher expected rates of depression even before the pandemic. So there's not so much burden. It's much more, uh, uh, so not so much burden concerning clinical depression, but it's much burden concerning higher level of distress, which is not clinical depression, but still it's suffering for, um, for students. And both studies revealed uh, a radical change in everyday um, uh, routine, from sleep to eating to sexual life to uh, social, of course, uh, social communication to the internet use, 
to use of uh, substances, alcohol, gambling, etc. So, but these are very complex issues, depending depending on what was the case before the pandemic. Some people increased their use, some people decreased. Depends on the. Uh, it, it seems to be very much personalized. A third thing was that during uh, November 2020. We, measure, we did a, a real-time uh, assessment of mask wearing in five cities across Greece. 25 of our postgraduate students went out in the streets and counted how many passersby were wearing masks and how they were wearing it. And the, uh, this was a real life. Uh, measurement, not, not a self-report measurement. And it was during the wave and during compulsory wearing of face masks uh, in the open. The results suggested that only 85% were wearing the mask properly. Uh, no age group of males achieved the mask wearing rate of 20 year old females which is astounding as, as a result. Uh, males were much less uh, adherent to mask wearing than females. And the overall, uh, the overall result suggests that the population was not really uh, adhering uh, to measures recommended by the government. Finally, we did an assessment of uh, conspiracy theories. We have 12, 12 conspiracy theories assessed in the general population, the 55,000 responses, and 26 conspiracy theories uh, tested in the student population. Now, this is, I, I would say, I would use the, uh, the adjective disastrous uh, findings. Something like half of uh, people working in the health field uh, do not trust uh, vaccines. They, they, they suggest, they believe that vaccination is almost dangerous, almost half of them across these 40 countries. Uh, many health professionals do not seem, many, many groups of health professionals do not seem to have different opinion in comparison to general population, which suggests, which puts big question mark concerning their true training and education in their schools. So uh, I wouldn't like to take much more of your time, but I think this pandemic uh, forced us as, as a society and as, as a planet to look at our image in the mirror. And what we see is rather suboptimal. Uh, it seems that we don't have the tools as a society and the procedures as a scientific community to deal effectively with uh, this uh, threat. And we need to change a lot of things in order to cope with threats in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Fudulakis, and particularly for outlining some concerning findings from your research uh, in terms of uh, uh, responses of health professionals in our country. Uh, I've recently seen an opinion poll survey where the, uh, those refusing to get vaccination uh, mentioned that they get most of their information from health professionals. And this is very worrying and concerning, not from the social media, but from health professionals. So the majority of them, 58%, uh, get uh, formed their opinion by discussing uh, their attitudes with uh, medical doctors, nurses, and pharmacists. So we do need to do better in this particular field of medical education. And uh, as Professor Chodras uh, outlined in the field of uh, risk assessment and risk communication, we'll probably need to enrich the curricula of uh, secondary education uh, with um, some courses or some lectures based on risk communication and risk assessment. Our next speaker is uh, Professor uh, Michalis Hurdakis, who is a professor of medical nutrition at the uh, Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Professor Moselus, and I need to congratulate you for the way you have been moderating the session so far. If not the best, 
one of the best sessions I've ever uh, been uh, previously. And I'm very privileged to be among this uh, esteemed faculty. I'm uh, somehow uh, lucky because uh, despite the very important topics that have been addressed so far, uh, not enough has been uh, addressed to the few topics I would like to uh, talk about. So uh, we know that there is uh, a that there are a lot of people affected directly by COVID in terms that they are being infected. But at the same time, uh, there is a big proportion of the uh, population being indirectly affected, uh, mainly by uh, the impact of uh, COVID-19 in a, a negative towards the life style. Uh, within the scientific group that I'm uh, privileged to be uh, coordinating called Nutric Lab uh, at the Medical School of uh, the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, we have published several COVID-19 related papers uh, in the last months. Uh, a couple of those also involved uh, collaborators from the WHO and from the European Society of Clinical Nutrition and Metabolism, the ESPAN. And we have seen in two of our meta-analyses, for example, that uh, lifestyle is being negatively affected, obese uh, people uh, due to the confinement uh, and the lockdowns uh, that have been imposed in many countries, in, if not all the uh, countries within the European region, uh, are forced to a more sedentary uh, way of living. Lifestyle uh, uh, snacking uh, has been increased, unhealthy snacking. Uh, alcohol consumption has increased. And in this way, uh, weight change uh, has been going upwards as well as BMIs. And it's uh, uh, unfavorable that this is also happening for children and adolescents. So we need to uh, have a special focus in the primary care, also among overweight and obese people, knowing that uh, similar uh, lockdowns or confinements might be negatively affecting a large a proportion of uh, the population. At the same time, the, a lot of talk has been uh, done for several supplements that would either uh, cure, uh, if I'm allowed to say so, uh, infection, or at least uh, provide some uh, uh, help from not getting infected from COVID-19. And we know that for the majority, if not for all of them, there is not evidence no evidence uh, supporting the idea of uh, taking high doses of uh, neither uh, minerals uh, nor vitamins to uh, counteract uh, the risk for COVID-19 infection. In particular, the last papers uh, we have published uh, refers to uh, vitamin D. And this is why better studies uh, are needed in order to uh, be able uh, to have a rationale to uh, use or suggest the use of supplementation for the large majority of the population. So it seems there are uh, there is a lack of good quality studies uh, having information about uh, deficiencies, uh, prevalences in Europe. And this is something that uh, I hope also with the help of the WHO and the new, soon going to be established uh, collaborating center, uh, implementing nutrition, as was already enough time said today, to mental health will be able to uh, make this gap a bit uh, smaller. Uh, last but not least, I would like to emphasize the importance of uh, public health. And next to the patients that uh, we all uh, want to treat, either with uh, uh, anticlone monibar or with uh, vaccines or with any new uh, drug that might be coming, we need also to uh, pay uh, very close attention to non uh, pharmaceutical ways of improving uh, the health of the population. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for outlining these key aspects and particularly focusing on obesity and nutrition uh, in the beginning of your presentation. And obesity, we all know, is an epidemic in Greece, uh, particularly in the young adult population. Uh, and it's one of the major determinants of health, which is largely ignored in public health policies in our country. And it's high time we paid attention uh, to this particular dimension. Uh, thanks again for this very important intervention. Uh, last but not least is Professor Panagiotis Pomidis, who is Professor of Medical Physics, Informatics and Medical Education at the Aristotle University in Thessaloniki. 
Thank you, Professor Mosielos, and uh, thank you for the excellent uh, moderation, and thank you also, Professor Anastasiadis, uh, for this excellent organization. Uh, I'd like to refer to uh, the technology effects, uh, both positive and negative, uh, regarding the pandemic and uh, the overall well-being and how this has been affected, in fact. And as we actually have been calling it with uh, Professor Anastasiadis, we have a new norm and we have to live for this, with this for longer than the uh, effect of the COVID pandemic lasts, in fact. Um, speaking from a personal perspective, I mean the laboratory perspective, I'd like to mention that uh, our research purposes, research efforts have been uh, changed, have been amended. We have been working with uh, sensitive populations like the elderly population, and we had much interaction with them. So what do we do? How do we run our research programs during this pandemic situation? So we had to change the mode. We had to change modalities of interaction. We had to organize and care for them and show that we did care for them. So we had to sort of uh, engineer new ways of interacting, uh, new ways of uh, approaching them and uh, in fact, educating and training them how to use these media and how they, to use these means. That has been a, a radical change, let's, way, let's say, in both our investigations and the way we conduct research, but also the way they see technology. And I have to, uh, to confess that this has been a positive experience, both from their perspectives and from our perspective. Three years ago, we have established the um, um, community of uh, collaboration, as we call it, for the elderly population, uh, people of older ages, and uh, we have uh, asked them to become co-investigators in our research. And uh, uh, this has been uh, uh, affected, obviously, by this pandemic, and they have participated in all these efforts. The second major uh, thing that we have experienced and witnessed is the effect of the pandemic and well-being in our students and in our education system. Many of the uh, morning, especially, presentations have mentioned this, especially from the faculty members in our school. But I'd like to stress the fact that we have been trying to establish telemedicine, teleeducation, collaboration by digital means for more than 15 years now. And uh, we couldn't manage as much as the pandemic managed over the year that passed. Uh, and I think that the uh, situation is not going to go back into the normal that we used to know before the pandemic as far as the education system is, going, is, is concerned. I think we have to moderate our way of teaching, our way of interacting with students, and the way that we provide training. And this has been a positive effect, I would say, of uh, the pandemic in the sense that we managed to modernize our teaching, our training means, and obviously our lecture capacity, if I could say it from the academic perspective. And um, if I can also expand this to more sort of digital health uh, ways and effects, I'd like to stress the, uh, the um, role that has been played by technologies during this pandemic. I mean, we have all been watching uh, our messages, playing with different apps, and playing with different uh, information media. If I can use my hat as an editor of the Health Informatics Journal, I have been bombarded with uh, uh, papers and manuscripts that have been submitted to the journal regarding the way that people have been interacting with social media and digital apps that during uh, the pandemic in all countries around the globe. And bigger the countries, the bigger the impact, I think, uh, there were. Uh, and uh, this has been also uh, something which is noticeable. Uh, if I would want to sort of uh, ask uh, is uh, whether all these have been positive or if we would like to distill the effects that they have in people. And I think uh, Professor Fundulakis mentioned earlier on from the mental health point of view, how things might have been not as good as they look and as they seem. And uh, concluding, I would like to stress the points that uh, 
uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Gerogiani mentioned earlier on that uh, we have now to look back into the way that cities function and make our cities more human-centered. And uh, I think there is much to be done in this way. And I think the European Commission is preparing missions that are going to deal with these things. And obviously, technology is there to assist the situation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Bamiris, for emphasizing the technological dimensions in managing the pandemic and particularly the rise in terms of digital application and digital health. We're going to see more of this over the next two decades, I think, uh, and growing use of digital applications. But together with the benefits of the technological innovation and revolution come a few challenges as well that will merit further discussion. For example, ethical issues related to algorithmic accountability. Uh, we do need to discuss about algorithms and biases in algorithms and how we can manage this process better to the benefit of our patients. After all, we're using these tools to improve population health and patient care. I think we have now concluded successfully a, a, a very uh, lengthy round of presentations. And we are going to take a few questions now. And thank you very much to all uh, of our panelists for your patience and your contributions. It has been a lengthy process, uh, but it has been benef very beneficial for me, at least. I've learned quite a lot from all of you. And, and I'm sure our audience has benefited very much from your wisdom. Uh, and if I could start with uh, a couple of questions, I'll start with Professor Koopmans, if you don't mind, uh, Professor. Uh, you uh, referred to long COVID. Uh, uh, which is poorly defined. Uh, but there are a number of questions I was hoping that you could uh, address uh, and offer some more insights. When we are talking about long COVID, how long is it? Mm -hmm. uh, we are referring to months, are we referring to years? Is this going to be forever? Is this going to be a huge burden to our healthcare systems for the next few years only or for many decades to come? The second question is, uh, and this is being asked by many people who have been vaccinated, uh, are we better protected, the vaccinated, against long COVID? So if we cut the infection of the disease, uh, are we going to be better protected in terms of not uh, suffering from long COVID? And the third question, which is, uh, 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 I've received lots of questions from parents about children. Is long COVID different uh, for children? Are they better protected? And it's not a big issue for them. Um, okay, well, uh, big questions. Um, so how long? Well, that, I think that's what we're still learning. What we uh, do see is in, in countries that do have uh, syndrome-based follow-up, um, like the UK, is, is that the, the, the rate of complications does decline over months, periods of months. But uh, there is a group, uh, and and it's not clear how big that group is that will that 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 continues to have, you know, not 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 very clearly defined, but health problems uh, more than six months out, um, and of course the follow up of long COVID is not that long yet, uh, and we have to learn from that. Um, it's it's not clear how distinct long COVID is from other post-infectious disease uh, fatigue syndromes, which of course uh, have been recognized. But there are um, uh, countries that do uh, recommend developing sp specific uh, multidisciplinary clinics to care for long COVID uh, patients, which includes uh, physical therapy, cognitive therapy, um, in, on how to to deal with this, and and of course there's a need for research in understanding mechanisms. Um, I think there is some good news. I've seen at least one uh, preprint that that had fairly convincing evidence that vaccination. So, with breakthrough infections after vaccination, you still can see some prolonged. Uh, health uh, uh, outcomes, but but less so. So vaccination seems to protect from not just clinically uh, some protection from infection, but also 
some protection from the consequence long COVID in vaccinated. So that I think that's good to know. And uh, well, for children uh, overall, we of course know that the uh, clinical impact in children is on the low lowest. <laughs> Not for, there are exceptions. There are descriptions of long COVID in children, but again, there was a recent study that that um, that uh, with careful evaluation and also with a control group found that that uh, risk is is relatively low, uh, much lower than in uh, uh, young adults and adults. Thank you very much for this very specific uh, responses to my questions. Thank you again. Uh, I have... Uh, uh, Professor, uh, Professor yeah. Mosialos, may I add another yes, question? Yes, absolutely, to yes. Yep. Professor Koopman, since uh, yeah. she took over now, uh, there is a, a question dispersed uh, in, in the chat regarding uh, the origin of, uh, of the virus. So uh, tell us, is it from the bats? Is it from the laboratory? Is it artificial? What is going on? Can you... I mean, specifically, point out what's going on? Um, yes, this is a complex question and uh, f food for a lot of uh, media <laughs> attention. Uh, based on the information so far, uh, my conclusion is, uh, and that's as part also of the, the international mission that looked into this, that... Uh, the origin from an animal is most by far most likely. And that is because there is a closest relative that has been found in, in bats, which have which harbor many SARS-related uh, coronaviruses. Um, um, and there's also similar viruses that have been found in other animals, the pangolin. So um, that points in that direction. What we do not know exactly is the steps in between because the the closest now recognized viruses still in terms of evolution are 30 to 40 years apart. So what happened in between is the big question. Has If you would do extensive surveys in bats, maybe that very, that more close relative would be found. That's one option. That's also what we've recommended. Uh, an option that I still consider uh, very possible is that there has been some level of circulation, for instance, in fur animals. We have seen in many countries in the world that have fur animal farming uh, that they are very easily infected and that a uh, virus can spread quite eff effectively in fur animals and that's a big industry in china uh, both for mink and for raccoon dogs that has not really been looked at and tested so those would be my first go-to's the lab um, the the constructed virus hypothesis i don't think is very likely if you look at what all the 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 backbones of viruses that we know it would take a lot of modification to make the current, uh, the, the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus out of that. The Another option could be some kind of accidental release, for instance, from a laboratory that did uh, bat screenings for, for viruses. Um, that's, you can never rule that out, um, but argues against the likelihood is that it's really difficult to culture viruses from bat samples. So that's based on those kinds of arguments. I think the zoonotic origin is, is really the most likely. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Koopman. Uh, just to apologize uh, that uh, you had a question to the chat that uh, it came to me a bit later on, and Dr. Kluge has left. So, uh, Professor Koopmans uh, had a quotation for Dr. Kluge. How do you see the relationship with uh, ECDC, the European Center of uh, 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 Prevention Disease Control? So, I think Zoa Brenda is uh, the most, let's say, uh, now uh, uh, the most relevant uh, uh, officer that can answer this question. So, uh, Dr. Brenda. How do you see ECDC and WHO then relationship? 
what I know is that the relationship is fantastic at the moment. There's really great collaboration and there are plans to strengthen it. And our RD regional director is very keen on that. This is what I would like to share. So the real question here is as to what extent we need to have a pan-European CDC. Uh, I, I, yes, I that's the real question. Do we need to expand yeah. the remit of the current CECDC, particularly post-Brexit, uh, to also include countries such as Britain and also countries uh, in Central and Eastern Europe uh, who are not members of the European Union and are not members of the European Economic Area. Yeah, absolutely. I think that Hans was very clear what, uh, the way he sees it. And I think that's, uh, that's really a great way to move forward. So if I could ask another question to you, Professor Koopman. So you made a very important point about access to vaccines. Uh, and you emphasize that lack of access in low and middle income countries uh, will haunt us in, uh, in the near future. Can you elaborate more on this? Well, is, uh, course, I think you're not referring to the ethical perspectives also, but also the potential uh, uh, well, pandemic yeah. perspectives in terms of the virus changing. Mm -hmm. Yes, so of course that's a, a, that's a thing. So the pandemic isn't over until it's over globally, mm. essentially. So we may be able to, so we are clearly moving to a diff different phase uh, in Europe because of our access to vaccines with all the challenges and difficulties. But um, as long as we have raging circulation in other parts of the world, yes, we can start, We can ex expect to, ha to have continued um, interference with, you know, with all sorts of global, global travel, global trade, uh, um, you will see health inequalities. There is the issue of uh, we don't really know what drives variant emergence, but of course, widespread explosive circulation is certainly not helping. Um, and um, a risk scenario is, is, of course, further drifting viruses, viruses that are less well covered by the current vaccines. That we don't, I don't think we see. Uh, that that reigning immunity that much for for protection from severe disease, but of course that would be a p bad scenario. Uh, but so there's that, and then there's also the societal aspect. There's the sort of the I I think the message that oh you can have the AstraZeneca vaccines that we don't want. It's just not a good way of building global collaboration. And we and 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 that's what you know. That's more philosophical. But I think in a globalized world with the continued threat of epidemics and pandemics, we are going to have to figure out how to do that better. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question, a couple of questions for Christos Kiratou. So I implied them um, after your presentation about monoclonal antibodies. Uh, what about volumes? Are we going to have sufficient quantities anytime soon? Or is the production very complicated and we'll have to wait for a few more months? And what about the cost of it? Uh, are you going to offer them on competitive prices? Are they going to be hugely expensive? And therefore, only a few countries will benefit, the rich countries will benefit from accessing these uh, very useful technologies. Yeah, absolutely, great questions. I think in terms of volumes, um, I think there's no doubt that even if we use every single bioreactor in the world right now uh, to produce monoclonal antibodies, uh, supply is not going to be sufficient to treat every single COVID-infected person in the world, right? So I think there's no doubt about that. Um, they, these monoclonal antibodies, not just the regenerative molecules, but I think other companies have also shown that they work very well against, especially the early stages, um, uh, of the disease, but there is absolutely no way we can give it to everybody. So from the very beginning, we've been trying to figure out who are the at most risk populations that would benefit the most from administration of the antibodies. And if you look at the documents that were published by FDA and CDC here in the US, initially they were restricting to population. Uh, the population that, was, uh, that had access to these, um, uh, to these antibodies was extremely narrow. There was a very narrow definition. And over time, 
as we were able to scale up production and supply um, uh, more antibodies um, and give more antibodies to the government, then the definition was slowly expanding. And I think we're going to see a little more of that um, uh, over the next month. So uh, there is no doubt that not everybody can be treated, uh, but I think we are definitely scaling up, both we and others are scaling up quite a lot. We are making millions of doses of these uh, antibodies now. In terms of cost, um, so far, the model that has been used at least here in the US is that the government is the buyer. They have bought um, a certain number of doses of monoclonal antibodies and they provide them for free uh, to the population. So and this is similar to the model, the model that has been adopted in the European Union, uh, especially some countries in the European Union. How this is going to progress in the future, um, as we are probably going to move into a commercial model for administration of these antibodies, is something that we don't know exactly what the model is going to be. We don't know exactly who's going to benefit from these treatments in the, in the future, as there is a wider and wider administration of the vaccines, obviously. Um, but we still see a huge number of people that are benefiting from them in spite of you know, the, the wide availability of the vaccines. So that's exactly what we are trying to understand. And we are trying to balance cost, obviously, availability, right? Um, and a benefit, a, a medication is useless if it's not being utilized, right? So providing something at a cost that is prohibitive in countries that basically do not need it does not make sense as a medical intervention. So this is a balance that we are very, very carefully trying to walk. Here. Thank you very much. That's a very fine balance what you have described. Let me take the discussion a little bit further. Will your company uh, accept a discussion on the basis of a reimbursement model uh, based on fixed reimbursement, like the Netflix model, a subscription model? All this is out of the question. Yeah, no, I don't think that anything is out of the question, but I don't think we are any company are trying to, to, to decide exactly how we're going to be administering these antibodies in the coming months and years. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Professor Anastasiades, do you have any, or the panelists? Uh, yes, Greece, there are do you have some, any questions? Thank you. There are some questions from, not, uh, well, statements, I would uh, say, because uh, during uh, all these wonderful lectures, there have been some uh, discussion around us, as you have seen. So uh, if uh, I may, uh, I would urge uh, Dr. Jackis, who is uh, uh, next to me, and uh, we were discussing uh, when. Uh, uh, Patricia Turner uh, were uh, lecturing about education in surgery and we said about uh, real life and uh, the surgical workload that have, has been uh, really dramatically reduced and uh, what will happen uh, from now on to all these uh, patients that have been uh, under treated and uh, what's the surgical or maybe the medical needs from now on. So Dr. Jackis uh, want to make, uh, to make a comment or maybe uh, Mrs. Turner add to what Dr. Jackis will, uh, will comment. So Well, my comment uh, would be that this is a, a real challenge and you can see on the faces of the people who are presenting today and we have been in the front lines of the virus, how much they have aged as a matter of a year or a few months. I mean, there is a tremendous amount of stress in uh, handling these patients. And uh, even in countries where medical care is abundantly present, there is a huge stress. But I would also like to point out one more thing. Our ancestors used to say there's nothing bad without something good. And uh, the bad is obvious here. I mean, many millions of people have suffered from this disease. And unfortunately, it looks like it's going to go on. And more, it's, it's a terrible thing uh, that has happened. And uh, is there anything good out, out of this? Well, I think suddenly the front lines is not the nuclear weapons, is not, but it's really centered in two subjects, climate change and the virus. And this make the world a more small world uh, and one world, which we didn't have before. The second thing is that the progress that has been made in the vaccines and the antibodies, 
already the same vector that was used in the vaccine was used to treat amyloidosis with genetic uh, changes. So uh, this is also something that I don't think would have happened so fast if it was not the precedent of using this vector with uh, the virus. And then you see in the informatics uh, in Greece, uh, Dr. Themist Themistocleos was able to put together a digital platform that would have been unheard of a year ago. Uh, so I think, uh, don't get me wrong, it's a bad thing, but uh, it has also accelerated changes and hopefully some changes that will last for a very long time and will start new uh, promotion of uh, our global humanity and progress than we had before. Um, well, uh, thank you. Uh, it seems that it's the need, it's the stress that made everything to happen. So it's not the, the virus him itself. And we always uh, say that uh, due to the virus, we, due to the pandemic, we had these uh, wonderful digital tools and uh, all these platforms and what we discussed. But uh, just think how we prioritize our research, why you should need one year to develop these mRNA vaccines when 10 years we were trying without uh, having the, this result, or why we couldn't have this uh, digital media before. Uh, uh, it's, it's the need, it's the stress that we didn't have, it's the priorities that we didn't put. So I believe uh, what pandemic indicates us is that we as scientists should reprioritize and then we will find uh, this, this outcome. And it's, it's wonderful what happened yeah. here. Allow me to disagree a little bit on this because a great progress has been made under duress. Vascular surgery was created in the Korean War because people were losing their limbs and then uh, Debeki started putting vascular grafts and saving limbs and saving lives. And here again, uh, we have a global this time uh, risk and uh, these things don't happen just because things are good. Uh, big problems, as they say, are big opportunities. So. The Romans used to say, seize the moment, let's find new things to take care of this virus. It's a terrible thing, but it's also an opportunity to do something useful. A lot of useful things have happened. Uh, I'm optimistic that at the end of the day, whoever of us are alive are going to be in a better world. Right. Should we ask then the Secretary General about his opinion? He's a doctor as well, he's not just a politician. No. I will completely agree with Dr. Zagis because, you know, even in Greece, it was the first time that public and private sector worked together. It was the first time in the last 50 or 60 years, uh, let's say that uh, private sector in Greece uh, worked in a 24-hour rota, accept patients from the national health system, and uh, all these and all the platforms that we uh, managed to implement uh, the paperless e-prescription was something that was discussing years and years, but we start uh, we started, decided to do that because people could not reach the primary care, health care premises. So uh, we faced the pandemic. We are stressed. <laughs> I'm not the same as I was one year before. Yeah, I'm stressed as well. But I think that we are taking the opportunity, and uh, that uh, pandemic is an opportunity for the, especially for the uh, health system. Right, and if uh, you allow me, there is a comment from uh, the deputy head of the school, uh, Professor Triaridis. Thank you for giving me uh, the opportunity to express some concerns. Uh, I've uh, I watched all this session with very interesting lectures. I would like to thank you all. And uh, uh, for our audience, in order to have completeness, because the session uh, has not mentioned some dimensions with regards uh, to uh, other dimensions of the pandemic. Of course, COVID uh, patients are the main uh, uh, topic of uh, the pandemic, but besides uh, the COVID patient, which uh, we measure the effectiveness and the adequacy of the healthcare uh, system with intubation, discharge, uh, uh, inpatient admissions, etc. 
there are a lot of chronic patients that over uh, the time that the, our health system all around the world was overwhelmed by uh, the COVID patients. A lot of chronic patients uh, uh, had their care postponed. They did not receive high standard of care as they used to before the pandemic. Uh, many choices have uh, uh, even in the priority of the health system uh, in order to cope with the pandemic had uh, uh, exacerbated the status of chronic disease and uh, having a lot of patients been uh, had an exurgeon myself we've seen a lot of cancer patients have their uh, tumor upgraded uh, we've uh, faced inoperable disease uh, we've pa uh, faced uh, patients that uh, are not receiving the standards of care we used before the pandemic era and unfortunately all this uh, 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 problem of the healthcare uh, provision is not measured by numbers. So we currently are focused on numbers who have to do with uh, uh, the COVID per se. Uh, but I'm afraid the pandemic uh, has uh, uh, has uh, forced uh, the health system all around the world to focus on this uh, issue and not to ignore, but to give a second priority to the chronic disease. And in the years to come, we're going to see that these numbers are equally important because uh, the healthcare uh, uh, system had not provided the, the, the standards of care it used to uh, before the COVID. So this is only uh, as uh, something for everybody to think about. We currently do not have adequacy of numbers in order to support or even argue this issue. A second issue I would like to mention for completeness of discussion of this session is regarding medical education. We've already said regarding transforming uh, the way we deliver medical education to the young doctors uh, that will become part of our health system in the near future. Uh, but what we don't see is that uh, there is a changing trend in the content of medicine as well. So we've been focused in a high standard of surgical care, high standards of medical care. And we see now with the pandemic that a lot of issues that we discuss now are going to change in the near future. So we're going not only to uh, change the way we deliver as an educator, uh, the knowledge to our young uh, colleagues and uh, uh, we're, it's going to change and the content of medicine in the near future. So uh, this is another issue I'm putting on the table. Uh, again, it's not uh, the time to discuss, but for completeness of this uh, uh, excellent discussion uh, for the lectures that already have been discussed, uh, I'm just putting these issues uh, just uh, for everybody to think about this in the near. All right, this is from the venue. Uh, it's yours now, Professor Moselust. I, I think we don't have much time uh, left. Probably we, we have a few minutes. Uh, we can take the discussion further uh, in terms of um, the points that Professor Triarizis has raised. I think Professor Kourdakis has made similar points in terms of changing nutritional patterns and the potential impact we're going to have on the healthcare system in terms of more people suffering from hypertension, heart disease, diabetes, and even respiratory conditions in the future. But there are other global issues we probably need to consider. And uh, Mrs. Yaroyani has mentioned the innovating cities and the healthy cities. Uh, that's fine for Europe, uh, but what about beyond Europe? Let's think about Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. So Nigeria is going to be a more important country in terms of population growth and the overall size of the population compared to the United States in 20 years from now. And Ethiopia is going to be a sizable country. It is expected that 300 to 400 million Chinese will move from rural areas to urban areas and similar numbers within India, here in Greece and other parts in Europe, uh, we're referring to migration as a threat to Europe when a few thousand migrants are trying to cross the borders and come to Europe. Uh, but when you look into internal migration in China, India and Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, this is going to be a particular challenge for urban development. So we're going to see the development of a significant number of mega cities, cities with more than 10 million people in many countries in Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa and even in Central and Latin America. All these cities are going to be developed in an anarchic way without planning for health and educational services and environmental protection. So where are we heading off then? 
And what is the European Union can do in terms of supporting these countries in terms of urban development? Uh, thank you, Professor Moselos, uh, for this, uh, this uh, question, which opens the floor for me to refer to the global cooperation. Uh, um, in fact, uh, this network of cities that we created, I think I hear two times my voice, maybe it's a technical issue that not from my... Okay, now it's okay. Uh, so, uh, as I said, we are promoting the global cooperation, so it's innovating cities in Europe and over the world. I'm going to share another publication uh, where there is also the health chapter, and you will see that uh, with this 3.1 billion euro that we invested in cities and including in all the urban sector, including the health sector, we created uh, more than 500 cities and network all over the world. So cities are twinning and twinning and exchange and share. Uh, there is the training aspects, there is the peer cities learning in all the cases. And I give an example from another sector, but it is, it is a case also for the health sector. For instance, in the urban mobility, the city, Greek city of Tricala, twinned with Belo Horizonte in Brazil. So with this, I want to say that global cooperation aspects and the global dimension of, uh, of uh, cities uh, was dealt with Horizon 2020, and this uh, continues to be encouraged uh, with Horizon Europe. Besides the bilateral agreements on research innovation under Horizon Europe, uh, there is uh, the, 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 this is still built, and there is the encouragement always uh, to to share and uh, to share with uh, international cities, with mega cities, because as uh, you you said very correctly said, uh, we are facing uh, an expansion of um, of uh, the world population, and so what is a problem for a mega city in uh, in uh, in US in uh, Latin America is a problem for. Uh, a European city, and this and COVID showed that, in fact, we are all together in the same boat. Uh, I would like to thank you for your uh, inspiring and excellent uh, moderation, Professor Moschelos, but also uh, I'm really honored that I have been in this inspiring and uh, esteemed panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you very much for uh, mentioning my hometown, Tricola. So I was brought up in Tricola. I'm very proud of this city, very small city in the middle of nowhere in Greece, forming alliances with big cities in Brazil. Uh, um, yeah, that's great. Um, final question for me. How can we address uh, the challenges with those who are refusing to, refusing to take the vaccine? Uh, and they're not a homogenous group. So we have those who do not believe in vaccination. Uh, it's a hardcore of about 10, 15% in a number of countries. There are those who are scared uh, of the vaccine. They say that we don't have sufficient evidence um, uh, regarding the production process too quick. We don't know about the long-term effects. And there are those who are in the watchful waiting category. So they are in favor of vaccines. They're not too scared. But they say, OK, let's wait to see what the real efficacy and safety of these vaccines is. Uh, so what can we do? Because currently we don't we have a policy, a generic policy. We don't differentiate vis-a-vis -vis these different subgroups. And this is a question for all panelists. Yeah, Professor Koopmans. Well, I can uh, say what the discussion is here in our country is we see um, inner city uh, problems with acceptance of vaccination. So there, there have been survey studies and surveys uh, and that look at, you know, ways of lowering the threshold. So it may be offering vaccination in a bus, walk in uh, around the corner of uh, you know, places where, that people visit. Um, school programs to to have sort of games around what what do viruses do? How does vaccination work? We have had 
art programs in, in uh, an exhibit how do, does vaccination work so those kinds of things for people that do not have that easy access to reliable information um and in our experience my experience the the sort of the people a little bit on the fence and uh with all these questions isn't this way too fast is it is it don't corner haven't haven't you cut corners um there, I think just just good and honest information saying this is what we know, this is what we don't know, but this is why we think uh, the risk benefit is really positive. Uh, I think that works uh, well for a big chunk of those um, people that really are non-vaccinees. In my experience, it will be very difficult to uh, convince. this short please yes <laughs> okay we are dealing with a wider a much wider problem uh, it's not uh, confined to vaccination it's a wider rejection of uh, science and medicine and in my opinion if uh, we had uh, a miraculous drug or a miraculous antibody or whatever miraculous uh, tomorrow and we, uh, people will uh, uh, will uh, deny using it will deny yeah we can hear you okay so people would deny using it as we uh, recently have experienced with uh, uh, icu units where people uh, uh, do not want to uh, go under a ventilator so uh, we, what we need here and now is to apply measures that will uh, more or less compel people to uh, be vaccinated and I think that we need to focus on education in the future as I said it's very much disappointing if not tragic that nurses and other health professionals do not differ in the percentage of uh, adherence to uh, conspiracy theories in comparison to the general population so their special training made no difference Right. So, uh, Professor Moschelos, will you please close the session? Yeah, we're going yeah. to close the questions now. And uh, I would like to thank all our panelists. We had a fantastic panel and a fascinating discussion and debate today. Thank you very much for your excellent presentations. We really appreciate that and for taking the time to speak to us today. And thank you, many thanks to my co-chair uh, and all the participants of this session. Be well and stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you.